Chapter 27 Section 2.20.23 Familiars that hunt are to be restrained from hunting other pets or endangered animals. Fines will be assessed if they are found to hunt these. I slept in the Albany house. Hamadia made it so it oozed comfort, and I needed every bit. We'd created a good relationship, the dryad and I. Plus, adding fertilizer to her roots in the basement made her very happy. I got my coffee there, then sidestepped back to the hotel. I didn't tend to keep clothes that would be appropriate for the State Department in Albany. Most of the time we were there, it was for a vacation, which meant jeans, shorts, tank tops, nothing that wouldn't get me written up for walking and wearing. But having good coffee helped my mood, if not my trepidation. I checked out the hotel and took three minutes to dump my suitcase back at the apartment in Atlanta. Just being in my room made me homesick. I hated this job. With a sigh, I left the hotel and walked, hoping a solution would coalesce in my brain. It didn't. The walk, however, gave me time to work out worst-case scenarios and my responses to any questions that might be thrown at me. By the time I walked through security, I felt almost serene in what would come next. Though the idea of the Emperor's sister being a player in all of this didn't make me feel any better. I was glad it was Friday. After I sat down at my cube, I shot a message to Joe, Sable, and Charles. Dinner tonight? I need to talk to you guys. Super hush-hush stuff. Charles, bring your computer? I didn't expect them to respond immediately, as I was pretty sure all of them were in their commute at the moment. I logged in and started digging through my email. There were notes about the requests from the Chinese, and I pulled that one open first. I had just been scanning over the treaty terms before, and while the trade items were the biggest aspect, there was a list of little things from all sides. It was the Chinese side I wanted to review. Monroe, get in here. Pearl's voice echoed through the office before the document finished loading. Carolyn hadn't shown up yet this morning, and I figured he was out with his mother or still sleeping somewhere. He was at heart a cat, and he had three different places to sleep right now. Who knew which one he would be at? I grabbed my coffee and pulled all the responses I'd come up with during my walk to work and headed into Pearl's office. Part of me was surprised she'd waited this long. I must have been here for at least 15 minutes. I entered the office, and Scott stood on one side. I quirked a smile as the wait was explained. The two chairs seemed like challenges— and I accepted it and sat down, coffee cup in hand. Explain to me just what you were thinking? Pearl did a good impression of a hissing calf, but she didn't have the teeth to pull it off. Which moment exactly? My hand wrapped around the coffee, heat leaching through the tumbler. Tomorrow I might need to get an iced coffee to help offset the surrounding tempers. When you told your familiar to kidnap the dragon of China? She said eyes trying to burn holes into me. Ah, I didn't tell him that. My voice stayed mild as I sipped the coffee, watching her. Scott paced behind me. Then what did you tell them? He said, his voice hard. Regarding that, I didn't tell him anything. He told me they were going to talk. Then they left. Where did they go? Each word dropped like a chunk of lead from her mouth, and I almost felt sorry for her. None of them are going to like this. Immediately after that? I have no idea. But I met with them last night, and Tia Tang went to visit his clan. He passed on a message for Chi Xing, though. Scott had moved around and stood in the space between Pearl's desk and the wall. What would that be? That he, Tia Tang, had thinking to do. I watched them sputter. That's it? He left to go think? And how do you know what his name is? He told me, of course. Tia Tang Dizu. It means blood of heaven. It's a complicated story that is not mine to tell. I finished as I saw both of them get ready to pounce on me. He will return or not when he is ready. Tell him to return now! Scott all but yelled at me, his emotionless way of speaking almost completely gone. The walk to work had done me good and removed all the worry I had about the reactions. You want me to tell a 15-foot dragon that is over 150 years old who has gone to visit family that he needs to go home now? Yes, 
he snapped. Have fun with that. I'll be willing to watch. The realm denizens regard sentient beings as acceptable prey, and they are very much on the fence if humans are sentient. They both fell silent, and I sipped my coffee. Finally, after many glances back and forth, Pearl spoke. You do realize you've created an international incident here, right? No, I don't think this is my fault. I might have been the catalyst, but given how isolated Tieting has been, I suspect it was a powder keg ready to blow. Well, what about the bird? Pearl asked, her hand wrapped around a pen so tight I was scared it might snap. This confused me completely. Bird? What bird? I didn't think they had seen the backyard. Hamadia didn't tolerate cameras from others on her soil, and few people would be stupid enough to regard Banyarl as a bird. But then, this entire situation made no sense to me. Pearl leaned back, staring at me. I don't know if you are innocent or if I'm going to strangle you with my bare hands. I almost want you to give us the stuff and we wave your draft because you create drama wherever you go. Yesterday, almost immediately after you left, I got an irate message from the ambassador to Japan. He was in country and had been meeting with the foreign minister over there and the royal magician. A flaming bird popped in and proceeded to chew out all of them at once, letting the royal magician know he'd never get his hands on Well's research. And if they dared to do anything to the rightful heir, there would be chaos to pay. And that he should stop being an ass and work with you. I groaned and thought about strangling the bird myself. That ploy had destroyed any chance I had of trying to give them things that didn't matter and hide the research, which I still couldn't understand why someone hadn't broken in and stolen, but I'd figured that out this weekend. That would be Georgaz, James Wells' familiar. I do not control him. He is an independent agent, and that is not something I would have requested him to do. They both just stared at me. Then Pearl sighed. Go. Finish up the notes that were requested. We'll work on the next day of negotiations. If nothing else, the Chinese might be a bit more conciliatory or they might be worse. Maybe the Japanese will remove that stick that's up their asses. She shifted her attention to Scott. We need to get sign off on the changes they requested. There should be some senators up now. She kept talking as I rose to my feet and left the room. It seemed the wisest course of action. The document was waiting for me, and I dug right in. This wasn't as much fun as a lab or helping people, but it was still about solving puzzles, and that got my interest. It was buried in the lists of concessions and asks. While the big ones were what Pearl had told me, the actual documents had dozens of minor things that I would have dismissed without noticing, except for what I'd been learning. There, along with a comment about exporting five tons of salt a year to Alaska and an agreement to drop the tariff on video games by a half percent, was the cessation of the moratorium on allowing U.S. companies to hire mages to work in factories they built in China. That necessitated research. I knew how the U.S. ran mage laws and what you had to do to hire one. It wasn't much different from hiring anyone else other than we had to show proof of completed draft service, and our contracts always specified the amount of offerings that could be expected per pay period during our employment. Most mages could do it easily, though there were days when Joe and Sable came home with their hair looking a bit ragged from a rough day. China had a different view on mages than we did. All mages were enrolled in the civil service and tattooed, even hedge mages, which meant they had a huge workforce of mages that they could use for 25 years. I shuddered at that idea. My decade was bad enough. A quarter of my life? No thanks. But what did that mean? I had pieces but no answers, and no one I could go to. I cataloged my resources. Sable, Joe, Sable's dad John Lancet, Carolyn, House of Emrys, Indira, Stephen, and Charles. That wasn't much, and outside of the house, none of us had any power anywhere. Could the house help? I didn't really have evidence, just overheard comments and pieces that didn't fit together. Bringing in Hamadia, Banyal, or Esmir didn't sound smart. They had little patience for human relationships as it was. The impact of this would get thoughts along the lines of, kill them all, and not much more. 
and the world would have to be ending before I called Tersane. I shuddered again, thinking about the snake. Before I could involve Indira and Stephen, though, I needed to go through the research James did. They would need to understand exactly what people were fighting over. Maybe I could use Georgas's little fit and make it look like I was on the outs with him. It might work. I decided I needed to stretch and headed out for a little walk. There were strange looks cast my way as I walked out, but I pretended not to notice them. Either way, this assignment would be exhausting. Once outside, I called Lucille. Yes, Corey? I need to look at the research James left me. It's becoming an issue. There was a moment of silence. I see. And I suspected she did. She dealt with the demands of people wanting that research for years. Lucille Blanding was the manager for his estate, and she would be until I completed my draft, which meant another decade for her, unless I did get out earlier. I'll have the key to the storage unit on the front hall table, as well as the list of bank boxes and keys for them. I assume the house will let me in. Lucille didn't know about Hamadia, but she knew the house was more than it seemed. If not, call me and I'll ask Caroline to come get it. Will do. And good luck. She hung up with her normal briskness, but that reminded me. I hadn't seen my familiar since last night. He hadn't been in the bed with me at the house or shown up at the hotel room. Carolyn? I sent out. As long as he wasn't trapped in a private realm pocket, he should hear me. Yes. He sounded sleepy, but okay. Hadn't seen you today. Everything good? I frowned as I walked. I couldn't remember the last time I had gone this long without seeing him. Yes. Went hunting with Tiatang's clan. Ate too much sleeping. Home with Queens tonight? He asked, hopefully. Yes, I invited Charles and Erchin as well. I checked, and everyone had responded with an affirmative. I need to get a key from the house for the research. I'm hoping I can grab it before we go home. Good. Sleep now. He sounded like he was falling asleep as he spoke to me, and I kept my laughter to myself. An overstuffed cat made a couch potato look energetic. He'd see me in a bit, and I suspected the hunt was good for him, though I had no desire to know what they had hunted. I walked back in, head high, ignoring the whispers that followed me, and dove back into my research. I needed to look at all the details from new angles. Halfway through trying to figure out what Japan really wanted, especially after the little stunt Georgas pulled, my computer screen flashed. My head jerked back, surprised, and I looked at the message. Call incoming. They'd shown me how calls would be via my computer. I put on the headset and clicked accept call. Whoever I had expected, maybe Scott or Daniel Lorison, the person glaring at me from the screen was not it. Emperor Chishin glowered at me. Close enough I could see the wrinkles at the corners of his eyes and the hair thinning on top though it was carefully styled. I stammered a bit. Emperor Chishing, how may I help you? Where is the dragon of China? Return him now! Even through the computer screen, I could feel his rage, and I narrowed my eyes. I did not do anything with your familiar. He told me to let you know he needed to think. I believe he will return when he feels he knows what he wants to do. That is unacceptable, he growled. My own annoyance bubbled up. And treating the creature that should be your best friend, the reason you can do so much magic, and your link to your ancestors like a dumb animal is? You should be ashamed of the way you've treated Tieting. He's over a hundred years old. He should be valued and cherished, not treated like something you can ignore. He's a very intelligent being, not a toy. I didn't bother to moderate my tone or volume, and I heard chairs squeaking and an office door opening. You dare, he hissed. The number of people out of sight of the camera who were having conniption fits right now probably numbered in the dozens. I didn't care. Dare to tell you the truth? Yes, and you know it. Tieting is visiting family and will be back when he is ready. Carolyn, I sent as I balled up this memory. Yes. He still sounded sleepy. K. 
catch. I tossed him everything in the few seconds while Chi Xing spluttered. Ah, very well. I will see you fired for this. No one can talk to me this way. Feel free. I'd love to be in a lab, or hell, on a lava field. The people I deal with would be nicer. I shot back. There was a glimmer of red scales behind him and muffled shrieks. I believe it is time for me to talk to my mate. Thank you, Corey. Tia Ting's voice rumbled in my head, and I saw the emperor's face pale. Have fun with that conversation, Chishing. I made my voice especially chipper and hung up. Jerk. Corey San Mamro! I heard Pearl bellow from right behind me. I turned and smiled at her. Yes? Chapter 28 Section 1.201.1 All mages that are enlisted are exempt from the hair regulations, except where it would cause risk to life or limb. Pearl spent 20 minutes yelling at me, trying to convince me to record a groveling message. I refused, and I didn't care, no matter what dire threats she came up with. That entire conversation had been between me and another mage and had nothing to do with my job here at the State Department. Pearl disagreed. When I walked out of her office, I packed up my stuff and headed out. It was Friday, I was tired, and this was a job, not my career. The second I was out of sight of anyone, I stepped with my laptop and everything to Albany. It only took me a minute to find the key laying right where Lucille said she'd leave it, along with the instructions to the storage unit. I picked up another envelope and pulled out the list of banks, along with the box number for each bank. There were five. It didn't surprise me Lucille had all the keys on another ring, and each was labeled with the bank they belonged to. But from everything Jorgas had said, the storage unit was what I needed to look at. I'd have to try to get to the bank before noon on Saturday. To my surprise, the storage facility was very close. Not close enough to walk, but close enough to stop there now before I headed home. I'll be back, Kamadia. See you. I called out to the house as I walked out. Fifteen minutes and one rideshare later, I stood in front of an unprepossessing storage unit. How in the world had no one ever broken into this place and just stolen everything? The only alarm I could see was at the gate. Here, there was nothing. Shaking my head and wondering what either I was missing or all the people who wanted this were, I twisted the key in the padlock, removed it, and pulled up the rolling door. It was dark, and I reached to find a light switch on the wall near the door. A flick, and light flooded the area revealing a few boxes on the side and a door in its frame leaning against the back wall. This is it? I'd been expecting boxes of notes, maybe a lab, or maybe more mementos like in the magic room in the house in Albany. But this? The boxes had a few file folders in them. They were either tax documents, contracts, or some pay stubs from decades ago. When was the last time I'd seen a pay stub? From what I could see, there wasn't much else except the door. I walked over to it. Painted off-white, it leaned against the wall looking like it had been pulled from a house and stored here. I moved over and lifted it up. There was nothing behind it besides some very sad cobwebs. I turned around one more time. Had all the research already been taken? It would remove both trouble and stress of being pressured for it, but would create a major headache for me. I turned and was about to walk out when I stopped and looked at the door. The memory of the door in the attic ate at me, and I sighed and went back and turned the knob, pulling it open. If I had been anyone else in the world, the door would have opened to reveal the same sad cobwebs that I had seen behind it. But it was me. And that meant, of course, when I pulled open the door, there was a gray and misty space beckoning me to step in. Carolian, Am I never going to get any sleep? He muttered in my mind. You've been sleeping for at least ten hours, so I have little sympathy. I have a magical door waiting for me to step through. Want to come with me? 
There was a minute of silence, and I could see him yawning and stretching as he made his decision. Yes, he said, and before I could ask when, there was a pinch and he was rubbing against my leg. You should have hunted with us. It was glorious. Smog has a wonderful hunting ground. I laughed and petted him. I do not think me, with my slow feet and lack of desire to toy with prey, would have been of much use. Humans, they do not understand how much fun the chase is. I gave him an arch look. When it comes to realm denizens, humans are just as likely to be prey. He yawned again. Ah, humans are boring. They run too slow. I didn't want to know how he knew that, so I changed the subject. Shall we? I sent a text to Joe and Sable, letting them know I was headed into a probable realm and that Caroline was with me. That made me feel safe, as I knew he could get me out of almost any situation. Caroline licked his chest for a minute, stretched again, and sauntered toward the gray enclosure, tail in the air. Well, since you won't let me sleep... I gave in to temptation and hip-bumped him through the door as I followed. He cast me an affronted look over his shoulder as the door swung shut behind us. The familiar grayness surrounded us. It felt like a realm space. Maybe this was an example of what everyone wanted to find. But really? A bunch of gray nothingness? They could have it. Hey, Corey, what are you doing here? I spun as Hamadia materialized behind me, or at least it sounded and looked like the form she normally took. At a certain point, I had to assume creatures were who they pretended to be, but I did crank up my true sense. I'm looking for research. What are you doing here? Though I had ideas bubbling up in my brain faster than I could sort them out. Oh, this is where James asked me to store everything. Come on, I'll show you. She spun and a path appeared, leading out of the gray mist to a sunny meadow. In a perfect world, I would have recognized it as the same place Joe and Sable had been held. But it looked like any glade or clearing I'd seen in the realms. Green grass, breeze, trees, a stream, and a bright blue sky. Never a sun, always a breeze. Jorgas had called them permanent pockets. Permanent for what or whom? What could you take from here? There they are. You want me to drop them back into the study? Himadia said, and I had to wrench my mind back to paying attention to her. Wait, no. I followed her finger and stopped at the wall of boxes. There weren't five or six boxes like I expected, or maybe a bunch of binders. No, there were 21 crates, each at least four feet tall, stacked in a pyramid, because why not? Could I, um, see, like, the top one? They are yours. You can do what you want with them. She floated there on the tips of her toes, making me look for ways. Vines reached up from the ground and deposited the top box there at my feet. I stared at it, trying to figure out how I would pry the lid off when vines came up, wiggled tiny tendrils under the cracks, making me think of the snake under my skin, and heaved it up. The lid was set down behind the crate. Thanks, I murmured as I inched closer and looked in. It was full of binders, and when I said full, I meant neatly packed and wedged in so tight I thought I might have problems pulling them out. Written on the spines were topics and dates. Some were thin, others three inches thick or more. I reminded myself that crying would solve nothing. I stared for too long at the overwhelming amount of information in a single crate before I lifted my head, looking into the blue, sunless sky. Georgas, you busy? There was no guarantee he would hear me, but somehow I expected he'd be very aware of anyone being here. I wasn't going to pry into Hamadia's personal life, but most of the higher-ranked beings seemed to know each other, or I was just being introduced to the people they knew. Yes? The word in my mind corresponded with a wash of heat and the smell of sandalwood, which I couldn't help but smile at. There are a lot of boxes and binders here, and I had some questions. I felt the flash of heat and turned to see him. 
He perched on a branch that had extended out from a nearby tree, his blue and purple tail feathers drifting in the breeze. This is a lot of stuff, I said, staring at him. I did tell you we looked into many things. He seemed serene, and it made me want to startle him. I might have been a bit cranky at this point. This is a bit beyond what I was expecting. Is there a binder or master list with all the important shit in it? Or at least an index? Otherwise, I'm going to spend a year just organizing it. A nasty thought popped into my mind. Or I could give it to the government and ask them to organize it for me, detailing out everything it contains. This time he glared at me. I do not understand why Kaelin likes you so much. That would be very unwise. He likes me because I can be just as sadistic as a cat with the correct motivation. So, master file? I crossed my arms over my chest, giving him my best glare. And I was hungry. It added to my lack of desire to compete with him. The phoenix shuffled his wings in obvious annoyance, then jumped up, disappearing in a flash of flame. Before I could start listing all the things I was going to do to him, starting with using his feathers in a pillow, he reappeared above me with a large binder in his claws, which he promptly dropped on me. I stepped back and caught it, though seeing him reminded me of earlier that morning. I had almost forgotten after everything else. And do you know how much trouble your little stunt caused today? Which stunt? He settled back down on the branch. Going and threatening the royal magician? He fanned out his tail feathers. So, you will never be allowed to use what we discovered, and there were rumors from others he was trying to figure out a way to steal it from you. I groaned. Ugh, Esmir would have understood. I needed it as bait, as leverage, dangling the opportunity for them to get it. It was a way to manipulate them. Everything is so twisted up right now, I don't know what I will or won't do. But either I contradict what you threatened them with, putting me at risk because that means you might not punish them if they kill me, or I have to abide by what you said and never even tell them details of what they could gain access to. I glared at him. The phoenix blinked at me, and I swear his colors dimmed. That did not occur to me. By my very nature, I am fire. I act. James was also very blunt, if deluded as to who his childhood friend had become. The birds sounded and looked sad. All the bright colors had dimmed, and the blue almost seemed to be spreading. It is his nature. Kath, enjoy the game. Phoenixes are all about the flame. That didn't make total sense to me, but I nodded. It's okay, but please... Don't? I don't know what to do with everything I've learned, and as it is, I need to figure out if I should just let you flame it all. The bird brightened. I could do that. Turn it all to ash and gone. For a heart-stuttering second, I thought he was going to flame in and burn everything to ash. But to my intense relief, he seemed to be seeking permission. That would create a lot of issues, not to mention I'm not sure what might be in there. Please don't. Begging might be over the top, but I could ask nicely. He sagged a bit. As you wish. That binder contains what he called a precy of all the experiments, and if he regarded them as failures or successes, again, do not let others get a hold of this research. He sounded worried, and part of me almost offered it up to him to destroy, but I wanted to look at it and I didn't want to throw away any bit of leverage I had. I'm not promising anything. Let me look, okay? He drooped again. Even his tail feathers seemed to drag. As you wish. Call on me if you have questions. Hamadia, Kerlin. He bowed as he said their names, then disappeared in a wisp of flame. I kept my comments of overdramatic much to myself. Thanks, Hamadia. Can you keep this safe? I probably won't need it for a while. Of course. That is what this glade is for. Storage. I must have looked confused because she laughed, exposing her green round teeth before spinning. James had me create it. Temperature always at what you call 
75 degrees Fahrenheit. No insects, no rodents, isolated and perfect. She whirled again. So he didn't create this? You did? Of course I did. If he had created it, it would have vanished with his death. Or maybe Georgas's ashing. Either way, they don't last past the mage. Hamadia had a way of making her answers sound like I had asked the dumbest question in creation. I brushed it away. Huh. Okay, thanks. I'm going to stop at the house, then back to Atlanta. Oh. She slumped down. When will you stay? I resisted hugging her. I don't know. Someday. I promise. Maybe Joe and Sable will have kids that you can play with. She nodded a glum aura around her. As you wish. Her form faded away as the last words were spoken. I sighed and readied myself to step to the house. Normally, I didn't step out of realms, but in this case, I felt safe as the realm and the house were owned by the same creature. I stepped into Albany, grabbed the bank list, the binder still in my hand, and stepped home. Standing in my bedroom, I groaned. Even as easy as stepping was for me, I'd used up almost half an inch of hair with all the jumping around. Oh well. I glanced at my watch, surprised it was almost seven. All this had taken longer than I thought. The smell of spices greeted me as I opened my bedroom door. My feet carried me into the living area that faced the kitchen. Charles was already there, and Arachina sat on a shelf we had put up for her. They turned as I walked in, still carrying the binder and the list. Hey, I said, smiling and feeling a weight drop off me. You won't believe the week I've had. Chapter 29 Section 1.125.2 Medical advice should only be ignored upon clear need or the draft officers declared an avowed proof of need. We all gathered for Joe's enchiladas with Mexican rice and margaritas. It was Friday after all. Carolyn showed up, but he only took a token bite of the beef, then sprawled out on the floor with Arachina perched on top of him. We all served ourselves and related the stories of our day. I had figured my day would win, but no, Joe won. It turned out there had been a denizen hiding in Lake Lanier, it looked like a mermaid, but had tentacles for hair. It had been breaking the filters in the dam, which is why stuff kept getting into the system and breaking things. At least that was the impression I got from her. But the part that made her win was when she had to swim down there and argue with it. I kid you not, I'm down there in the water with a tank on my back, glaring at this thing that looked like Tursing Wannabe. She was pissed that we weren't letting the water flow freely. I was trying to figure out if I should fight her, doctor her, or call you. <laughs> she laughed, pointing her fork at me. Why me? I protested. What would I do? Sable's the one with water, not me. Ah, but you're scary. I thought maybe you could get her to listen, but then, believe it or not, Carolyn saved me. Of course I did, but I don't remember getting wet. And I assure you, I would remember getting wet. Carolyn didn't even lift up his head. Joe snorted, then grinned fondly at him. <laughs> you let us practice mind speech with you, so I tried it. I didn't think it would work, but I didn't know what else to do. And she freaked out, completely stunned I could talk. We were down there a while, and I promised her that I'd see if there was a water place in the realms she could get to, which I'll have to ask Esmir about. And she agreed to stop breaking stuff once I explained what the dams actually did. I tell you, I didn't know if I was going to make it up here again. She took a swallow of her margarita. Why? She was attacking you? My mind whirled as I tried to think how I could have rescued her. Nah, I was running out of oxygen. Man, that chica acted like it had been years since anyone talked to her. I promised an answer next week, so Kirlian, can you ask your mummy for some help? As I was the impetus for you to gain this ability, of course... The smugness in his tone had all of us giggling. Even Charles seemed to be fighting chuckles. Corey, I am on fire! The words pierced my brain, and I convulsed in pain as they seared into me. Hamadia? What? 
I asked, swallowing through the pain. I recognized her voice, but I had to fight to concentrate as her panic lashed at me. Help! She begged, her voice fainter and panic stricken. I shook off the pain and stood. Carolian already was standing, the sleepiness gone from his posture. Carolian, can you take them the long way and I'll sidestep? I asked, imaging the space at the top of the driveway, off the grass where nothing was kept. Yes, we will be there in a minute. I knew he would open a rip to the Chaos Realm, then another one to Albany. It didn't take long, but still longer than I would take. I nodded at all of them and stepped. The cool night air was tainted with smoke, and a wash of heat drifted across my face. The porch was engulfed, and it was crawling up the outside of the house. I could hear the faint sound of sirens in the distance. Hamadia, are you on fire in the back? No, but I burn! She wailed, and I winced. Mind speech cut through your mind like a headache on steroids when the speaker was this upset. I grabbed hunks of the lawn and flowed them over the biggest flame spots on the ground as I ran for the only hose I remember seeing. Sable had water, but she needed it available to use it. I cranked it on full bore as I felt a telltale flash of pain that meant a rip had formed. Keep the water flowing, Corey, I got it. I heard her and sighed in relief. A wave of water rose up and dashed over the flames, and they spread. I stared, confusion at the incongruity. Flames didn't spread from water. They went out. I turned, looking. Then I saw a bottle laying on the ground, broken and smoldering. It clicked. Merlin's balls, they tossed napalm! I'd spent enough time in the chem lab to know the properties of napalm. Water would just spread it. Joe, move air away from it. I'll keep smothering. We worked in tandem. Joe depriving the flames of oxygen while I grabbed lumps of earth, moving it over anything near the ground to keep it starved. The fire trucks, the source of the sirens, turned down the street we lived on as we fought to get the flames under control. I struggled to pull enough dirt up to smother flames, yet not damage anything. It wasn't like I could lift up a lump of soil and float it. I had to raise the earth up in a wave and have it crest over the flames but that meant pulling at earth that structures rested on, like the porch. Moving it around helped, but the damned jelly-like napalm seemed to want to burn. Sable, can you convince fire to go away? She made a face. I've been trying, but it doesn't want to. It finds this all so yummy. Something about both the chemicals and Hamadia has it almost drunk. I've even offered blood and it takes it, leaves one area, and pops back up. I'd managed to smother most of the fire on the porch, but there were still flames flickering up the walls and to the roof. Joe, can you create a bubble over the entire house and move the oxygen out? She frowned, then nodded. I think so. Air doesn't like to stay away for very long. The serial killer air mage must have practiced extensively to keep air away from her victims so tightly. Though, removing the oxygen would have been... My brain caught up to my random thoughts as I fought to smother. Joe, just keep the oxygen away, or have it bind with... I raced through easy combinations. Try turning it to ozone. That's three oxygen molecules. That doesn't feed flame, right? I asked, desperate to stop the flames. You don't ask for easy things, do you? Joe muttered, her eyes narrowed and focused on the fires. I saw a whisper of offering flare from her hair as she stood there, my heart in my mouth. I thought about other things I could do if this didn't work. The fire trucks came to a loud screaming halt next to us and started grabbing hoses and connecting to the fire hydrant. We had contained most of it, but the roofs still had spots of flame, and I didn't want to think about the damage inert napalm was doing to the house. Hamadia, are you in pain? Yes. No. Both. She responded so fast my head jerked back as if I had been slapped. What can I do to stop the pain? I could hear Sable arguing with the fireman, who didn't seem to believe her. A spray of water, so much easier to pull from the air than anything else, slammed into flames, and they just rode it, spreading to another part of the roof. Ugh, why doesn't anyone ever believe us when we say things? I honestly didn't know if it was that we were mages, women, or both, but it annoyed the shit out of me more often than not. 
The chattering behind me increased, but I focused on Joe and Hamadia. Stop the fire. I will need sustenance. Much later. Got it. I looked at Joe. How's it going? Ozone sucks. It likes to break apart. She gritted out, stress clear on her face. I can get it to create, but it really doesn't want to stay. And I'm also trying to prevent it from grabbing onto hydrogen and forming water. That would spread the flames further. I can transform stuff, but right now my options are the elements available. I can't use fire like sable. Her words were short and sharp, and her rings reflected light from the fire. Rings? Joining? Wait, I can use both. Esmir had mentioned it to me, but I hadn't spent much time playing with that aspect of our joining. If I ever was going to, now was the time. I arranged what I wanted to do in my mind. Carolyn pressed into my side and I gave him a pet as I tried to pull off something that might not be possible. I created a molecule's thick coating of argon across the house and under the fire, pulling on Joe's strong and transform. I pulled in the element to create a shield that wouldn't burn. Then, I pulled all the summer leaves toward me with air, offering recklessly. Please. And it worked. Air accepted my plea, but only took a portion of what I had offered up, to my surprise. It seemed I could pull on Joe's abilities at the same level as she could. The possibilities stunned me as I watched my plan tumble into place. The leaves swirled around into a pile across the lawn, even being pulled from around back. I looked at the fire and dangled food and more hair, not asking them to quit burning, but to change their focus to this easy food and not the house I had protected. At this point, the only thing still burning was the jelly-like fuel. But there Joe was, preventing an easy burn by removing the oxygen from the air. There was a moment of pouting from the fire. Then the flames leaped from the house to the leaves, which went up in a burst of flames as the hungry fire devoured it. I sagged with relief, as there wasn't a bit of fire on the house that I could see. Hamadia, are you still on fire anywhere? I waited for a response, and tried to gather myself as a firefighter headed toward me. The leaves were almost gone, but fire seemed to have tired of the game, or knew we wouldn't let it keep burning. A hose was getting ready to be aimed at the embers that were fading fast. Ma'am, you the owner of the house? Yes, I faced him and saw the word captain on his jacket. I am good. There is much to repair. But you saved me. All of you. Hamadia's relieved voice floated through my head at the same time the captain spoke. Can you tell me what happened to you? Hamadia must have heard the question because she answered in my mind, and I repeated what she said. A car drove by. I didn't see who was in it, just heard it. I substituted heard for felt. Hamadia had felt the vibrations from the engine and their music. Then there was the sound of a bottle breaking, and fire started to spread. Do you know how many bottles were thrown? He asked, staring at the house. Not me. His brows drawn together. At least three. Maybe five. Hamadia wasn't sure, as after the first two, she'd panicked and come screaming for me. This isn't something I've seen out here before, he stated turning to look at me. I just stopped the fire. His eyes flicked to the tattoos on my temple as he asked. I explained what Joe did, and then what I did, but I credited Sable rather than me. I didn't want anyone realizing how strong I was in fire, now that we had joined. Getting tested again might be a very bad thing. He nodded as he stared at the house. Not bad. Usually we have different methods for the few mages that become firefighters. You can find it listed on various websites if you're interested. But make sure your chemistry comprehension is strong. Most firefighters tend to understand a lot about chemistry. He said all of this abstractly, his attention still on the house and the smoldering bits. We are going to scrape up the remnants of the napalm and chemically treat everything. The truck with the chem should be here shortly. We'll double check nothing else is still smoldering. You good? I nodded my head, suddenly exhausted. Running away tomorrow for a hike in the mountains sounded like a very good idea. He left, and Joe, Sable, and Charles moved over. So what exactly happened? Joe asked, her voice low, even though we stood far off to the side, away from any firefighters or the sheriffs that were making their appearance. It took a few minutes to explain what Hamadia told me. 
Joe wrapped her arms around Sable and gave me a worried, pensive look. Corey, do you know who did this? No, I replied, shaking my head. Carolee impressed against me, but he wasn't purring. His attention focused on the house. But to be honest, at this point it could be anyone. The U.S. wants me to hand over the research, China blames me for their dragon going away, and Japan still hates me. There was silence. Then Charles chuckled. <laughs> you know, Corey, I'm starting to understand the nickname you had as a teen. Corey Catastrophe Fits. Only you could have three countries pissed at you. Not people. Entire countries. I laughed. A bitter, unhappy laugh. <laughs> Great. Not exactly the start I wanted. Joe gave me a wry smile. Did you really expect anything else? No, I really liked the daydream. Stupid reality. Sable pulled me into a hug. We love you anyhow, even if you are a walking trouble magnet. Yeah, but what am I going to do about this? The question hung in the air long after the police and firefighters had left. Chapter 30 Section 1.141.4 all passports from other countries and from the U.S. must clearly display the class and branches of any mage above hedge mage. Anyone found counterfeiting this will be held as a rogue mage. Sunday, Carolyn and I sidestepped to a location in the Appalachians, well away from everyone. We'd found the spot on one of our hikes, and it was far enough along that there really weren't any people around— Carolyn went first to make sure the area was clear. Then I followed. We hiked for about three hours. Well, I hiked, and he chased and cavorted and acted like a kitten again. It felt good to be out in nature, and by the time we were done, I'd worked out most of my stress and needed a shower from our effort. After getting home to Atlanta, I pulled open the binder and started to read. James had wide-reaching interests, and the binder was meticulously detailed— too detailed from what I'd seen of his other writing, and the handwriting looked very familiar. I set that tidbit aside and focused on what he had discovered. The high point was definitely the ability to create a stable realm, but I needed to find out the details. Something about how it was phrased made me think we had little to worry about, but right now I needed to get a good idea of everything. He discovered the gem that was in the ring on my finger, Asterine, it had more than the properties that Esmir had noted. It could store memories, act as an amplifier, and was immune to heat. Only a mage could mine or facet it. I grabbed a notepad and started writing the things to not share with anyone I didn't personally trust. This was the first item on it. I kept reading. The list seemed huge. He had notes on creating memory stones, how to get a familiar, uses for realm plants— some of the medicines might perform miracles. I put that one on a list for me to research. There was a list of creatures and their descriptions, the nature of the elements, at least five rituals that worked every time, though the ingredients needed would only be available to a few. Phoenix ash, dragon scales, etc. He had travel journals about what he found in each of the realms, the history behind familiars from the denizen's point of view, even information about how the realms connected to us and theories about the Area 51 rips. Things I noted to never let out to common information were reemergence, pocket realm creation, and stable passages between realms or pocket realms. An interesting discovery was a shield that could only be done in conjunction with water. It basically created a static water wall that no ship could pass through, though it required multiple mages working in concert to keep it up. It would only work if you had a small island, maybe in the middle of a river. All in all, it was so much information my mind spun. The reemergence, asterine information, and the medicines went on the list. I sat there staring at it. I knew I needed to talk to Lucille and Georgas, but I needed to head to bed, as I really suspected tomorrow would be drama-filled. I stepped back to the glade, Hamadia made sure I could easily access it, and left the binder there. I didn't want to risk anyone breaking in and finding it. If they were willing to burn my house, I didn't think they'd have an issue with breaking into the apartment. Morning came too early, 
but taking a shower in my bathroom with my products after sleeping in my bed and getting to make my coffee helped a lot. You coming with me? I asked Carolyn as he lay sprawled on his bed. Your work is dreadfully dull, but I do not trust the people you work with. You can sleep under the desk and I'll spring for sushi for lunch. I just had a bad feeling about today. I didn't have a phone yet that was work issued, and I'd purposefully not even opened my laptop this weekend. I didn't want to know or see what drama was going on. Mmm, shrimp, he murmured as he yawned, stretching out like he had no bones. Show off, I said. I'm stepping to that corner. We'd scoped a corner out in the break room that never had anything in it. It worked for me to step to, then head out to my cubicle from there. We'll meet you there in a few. No getting into trouble before then. Protesting would have been useless, as we both knew trouble seemed to find me. I grabbed my little shelled briefcase, straightened my jacket, and sidestepped. The corner was empty, as was the break room, to my relief. I noted most government workers didn't show up at seven, making the odds in my favor, but I probably needed to see if I could find another place. I strode out to my desk the case rattling faintly behind me. This also had the advantage of not having me walk past Pearl's office. I sat down, pulled out the laptop, logged in, and groaned as I saw my email. It had been two days over the weekend. How in the world did I have 83 emails? A fortifying sip of my coffee, and I dove into my email box. At least half were from human resources, with things I needed to do for my paychecks and insurance, all the paperwork that kept the world moving. The others were Pearl issuing edicts, while Scott chimed in. Some of it was normal, discussing strategies, asking who'd approach for approval, copying her as a matter of course. But the ones that showed up on Sunday were different. An email popped in as I read about China's demand, and even an email, it was a demand, to meet with us first thing Monday morning. The email was from Pearl, saying she needed to talk to me as soon as I got in. I considered not seeing it, but decided getting the fight over now was better. Carolyn, you want in on my meeting with Pearl? As an answer, I felt a flash of pain, then him dropping his chin on my hand. My nose twitched. You talked Sable out of eggs, didn't you? She had extra they would have gone to waste. I gave him an arch look, then scratched his head. Yes, they would have. I pushed myself to my feet. Come on, the dragon awaits. Tia Tang is much scarier than her, he said, pacing next to me. Yes, but Tia Tang can only kill me. She can get me reassigned to Alaska. I have never hunted a moose. That could be interesting. You should order me a moose. I must know how it tastes. I refrained from commenting and stuck my head in Pearl's office. You wanted to see me? She jerked her head up and glared at me, her mouth opening. Then she snapped it closed. Sit. Scott won't be here for a bit. I walked in and sat. She didn't bother prevaricating at all. The Chinese refuse to negotiate if you are involved. I'm pulling you off. A variety of things fought for supremacy in my mind, and I tried not to blurt them all out at once. I saw an email regarding that this morning. I'm not sure that is the right way to go. I said the words slowly, fighting through my desire to throw my hands up and let them do whatever they wanted. Pearl tapped perfectly manicured nails on her desk. And why do you think that? They are lying about something, And if you keep me there, I suspect it will keep them off balance. And right now, the dragon is on my side. If I have a side. That much I wasn't sure about. But whatever it was, I thought that my credit with the denizens was higher than the emperor's. And what does that buy me? Pearl sounded curious and scheming. The second was what told me I had a chance. I will draw their ire. And the fact that they want me gone means they are probably hiding something. Keep me there as a way to keep them off balance. I suspect Tietang is chewing on the emperor right now, and there might be a change in policy soon. I left it at that. I had no proof of anything else. 
Pearl lifted her eyes to the door. Well, what do you think? Scott heaved a sigh and moved all the way into the room. She still isn't that much use as she doesn't speak any of the languages, and Japan refuses to acknowledge her, but it might be worth it to have her in the meeting China wants today. It might prove useful to figure out what they really want, not just what Chun Wen is presenting. His former excitement had faded, leaving him back with his flat monotone. Listening to him talk was like listening to someone droning on. With effort, I brushed that away. See what comes out of the meeting today. I didn't mention Carolian. There was no reason to give up that secret. Scott looked at his watch. They wanted it first thing this morning, as someone from China will be on the call. We should go now. I nodded and rose, making a quick stop at my cube to grab a notebook before following Scott. Carolian yawned again, and I hissed at him. He was making me tired. He whipped his tail at me, smacking my thigh, clearly unrepentant. We were at the conference room first, the teleconference linked up but blank. I hid to the side, like a good peon, and this time I just waited, wanting to see. Carolian had slunk under the table so he could see the people coming in. Scott fussed with his computer, trying to look busy, but tension radiated off of him, so I didn't buy his act. Carolian's tail tapped back and forth on my legs as we waited, They had wanted to meet at 8 a.m. No one showed up until 8.30. This was a standard ploy and didn't surprise me. Chun Wen walked in and stopped, his assistant still hiding his face. She is supposed to be here, he stated, glaring at me. Scott shrugged. We wanted to see if we could change your mind. Merlin Monroe has much to offer to any discussion. Corey. The human next to the fat one is doing magic, chaos-based. I can taste it. I sighed and slid my phone away from me as I pulled up an electro shield. Please ask your mage to quit casting magic. I tilted my head as I felt it hit. Disrupt thought, I believe. I thought all mages were to be disclosed and clearly visible. I tapped my temple, easily seen as my hair was back, whereas the assistant never looked up, and his hair hit at shoulder length, hiding everything like a curtain. Scott stiffened. This is not allowed. I will bring this up to the ambassador of both countries. His body stiff with outrage. Chun shrugged and sat down in the chair, looking at us. They will not care. I have more power than they do. Scott let go of his anger and sat down as well. So, you are one of the assistant ministers, Trade? Chun didn't say anything, just watched us. So, what do you want? The assistant sat up and stared at us for the first time, a tattoo peeking out of his temple. We have been talking to Japan, and we believe we have reached an agreement with them. Scott leaned forward. I was unaware that Japan had reached out to you. This was supposed to be a three-way negotiation. Chun lifted one shoulder. We had a common concern. My stomach twisted as his eyes never strayed from Scott. This would not be good, no matter what. Which is, we addressed most of the issues earlier. The corners of Chun's lips lifted, but there was no amusement in his gaze. We have concern with your pet Merlin being at the table. Given the rightful enmity Japan feels for her, it seems counterproductive to have her here. I resisted, bristling and getting pissed, because he had a point. I had told them Japan would have issues with me, but I needed to try and do my job. In theory, China had no predisposed issues with me. The thought I was only making it worse made me shrink with guilt. Ah, Scott leaned back, his hands calm on the table. What do you feel we should do? Personally, I think anyone that has offended a foreign government so badly should be turned over to them. They must extract their satisfaction. It is poor manners to throw such things in their faces. It is, how you say, a bad look. His voice was smooth as ice as he spoke, shifting his attention to me. All of us have our orders. She has value if Japan would only see it. She has much they want. 
Scott replied smoothly, as if they weren't talking about me like I was a toy someone wanted. Much that is mine and not my government's to give. I snapped, glaring at both of them. Chun smiled that non-smile again and started to answer. I flinched at a stab of pain as Carolyn bumped up against my leg. Then the conference room was full of dragon. The red of Tiatang's scales almost glowed as he writhed around in the limited space. The assistant's eyes widened, while Chun paled, sweat dotting his forehead as he tried to scoot back, but there wasn't anywhere to go. Curry, you need to come with me. Tiatang's voice rang in my head, and the gasps from everyone else told me it was a broadcast. Tia Teng, I can't just go with you. What is going on? I tried to sound pleasant, but I nudged Caroline with my foot. What is going on? No, you must come now. You must witness. His tail went over the desk and wrapped around my waist. Wait, witness what? The words had just finished when he pulled, and we disappeared from the conference room. Chapter 31, Section 1.142.5 Familiars of foreign mages are granted the same rights as local ones, no matter how exotic they may be. Any threat to a familiar can be expected to be met with lethal force. Being pulled along via a sidestep let me know I really, really prefer to move myself. I fought dizziness and kept my eyes closed until I thought I might not fall over. I could feel Tia Tang's tail still around me while Carolyn had followed a moment later, and he pressed against the front of my legs while his tail tapped my thigh. It was rapid enough I knew he was agitated, but that meant not ready to kill. I forced open my eyes and almost shut them again. I stood in a huge room with black marble floors laid out in huge squares. Pillars the color of blood rose up to support a ceiling that looked like a thousand tiles, green and brown, while the walls were beige, with red detailing everything, except the throne at one end, with daffodil yellow cushions. The opposite end had two huge doors in a brighter shade of blood, but that was what I grabbed at a quick glance. My attention was on the people. The room was not crowded exactly, but contained more people than I could count. A face I recognized. The emperor stood on the top of the dais his throne resided on, while around him everyone stared at us. If he could have thrown laser beams from his eyes, I knew I'd be dead. You dare! He snarled. I figured it was Mandarin, but with Carolyn seamlessly translating, I didn't worry about it. For a minute, I thought he was talking to me, but Tia Tang rose up, his tail dropping away from my waist. I stumbled a bit, leaning into Carolyn's heat and strength. I dare. I am the dragon of China, and I am the emperor. Everyone was backing away from him, and I felt water being pulled from me. I took a good look at his temple, something I hadn't really bothered with before. Water, time, and pattern, strong pale and fire and air. A blasted elemental mage. People were chattering, their language wrapping around me like a dirge. I don't think so. I hit him hard with disrupt thought and felt my body reabsorb the water he had been pulling out as I broke his concentration. I started to reach for earth. It was the best way to protect myself and give me the precious seconds I needed to concentrate and step home. Enough! The mental roar went through my mind, my bones, my soul, and I whimpered, leaning on Carolyn. He growled softly and wrapped his tail around me, grounding me. I really just want to go home. The people in the room cowered, some kneeling on the floor in various positions of fear and obeisance. The emperor looked shocked, and the three people around him all looked torn between yelling and smiling. It was a weird expression. The same guard types huddled near one of the columns, guns drawn, but they didn't know who to aim at besides me. Personally, I felt like I was the one that should be pointing guns at them. I gently pulled earth toward me, 
the stuff in the air, on the ground, and mixed it with my bioelectric field. It wasn't the best shield, but hopefully it would slow down anything coming at me. So many mages, and most of them looking at me with expressions I could not identify. China had a type of draft, and all their mages were marked. But what really identified them was they, like the mages in Japan, all had a uniform to wear. The Japanese mages tended to wear traditional kimonos for women and men. In China, they all, except for the royal family, wore a lanshan in gray, with the color stating their primary class. Red for chaos, blue for order, and yellow for spirit. The hall was full of mages, and if they were told to attack me, I'd retaliate. I have watched the Qin Dynasty for more than a century. My sacred right as a focus is to guide my charge, to help them grow into a mage worthy of magic. I have failed in my duty. My choice was flawed. Tia Tang's words flowed into my head, and all eyes were locked on him. Well, everyone else's. Mine were firmly on the dais and the dangerous people there. From the looks on the emperor's face and the women next to him, I might need to start worrying about contracts out on my life again. What do you mean your choice was flawed? The emperor had his arms crossed on his chest and glared at the three of us. The temptation to hide behind Tia Tang flashed through me. It still exposed my back to others, but I wasn't sure this wasn't going to break down into a magical firefight. I choose the emperor, Tia Tang stated as he flowed in his glide walk up to the throne his face tentacle whiskers seeming longer and floating out in front. And I no longer choose you. The tentacles whisked out and wrapped around Qixing, holding him immobile. Coruscant Muro, magic's held. I charge you to witness my disavowment. Ah, oh, crap. I stood up straighter and looked at the dragon and the throne. As magic's herald, I so witness... Really, there wasn't anything else I could have said. And then, Chia Xing screamed. It was a sharp, short scream. Not of pain, but horror. Something pulsed in the air, and color bled from the man's face. Not his face paled, but the color from his tattoos was pulled out and fell to the floor like dust. The whiskers unwound, and Chia Xing stumbled back, his eyes wide and mouth open like he was silently screaming. What did you do? The whisper came from one of the people on the dais, but I couldn't even tell the gender of the person who spoke. I disavowed him. Magic deemed him not worthy. Now I must choose the ruler of China. His voice rumbled through my head like the voice of a god, and I saw more than a few people fall to their knees as he spoke. A woman pushed her way to the front, the Merlin tattoo clear on her face, chaos ascendant. She had her hair in twists and knots that must have taken hours to style. Her nose was sharp, and she looked too much like the picture of the Mongols that had once ruled the majority of the world. I am next in line for the throne, as I am the second oldest. Even with Carolian's translating, I heard the arrogance, pride, and avarice in her voice, she reminded me of one of the statues that Hamadia watched over. The look of needing power was the same. I think not. You would bring this country to great heights and destroy it in the process. Your grasping need for power is not balanced by mercy or compassion. The disdain in his voice would have made me crumple. The woman gritted her teeth and stood up taller. It matters not. The Qing dynasty must continue, and I am best to lead. You can temper me with mercy or compassion. She said the words as if they had a bitter and disgusting flavor. True, the Qing must stay. Your father was fertile and your mother fecund, but your father had many concubines. The dragon turned, his head panning the crowd, but I kept my eyes on her. What little scene when I'd glanced at the setup for China told me she had to be Hui Ling, the oldest daughter and the minister of magic. Surely she wouldn't start something with Tia Ting, would she? Her eyes caught mine, and that glare cut me to the bone. No, she blamed me. 
Why is it always me? China needs a strong ruler who understands that together we are stronger, who can work with others, and yet retain the pride in what makes China great, one that will lead the world to a better state. He had stopped before a group of mages. The woman Tia Ting focused on wore the double stripe of a merlin, order and spirit. Xi Xi, step forward. There was a gasp through the area, and I saw a few heads peek up. This was worse than watching a telenovela. Who was she? And why was she dressed as one of the mages that served China? I had no idea what was going on, and I couldn't make Joe pause it to explain everything. A young woman, I figure in maybe early 20s as she was a mage, came forward and bowed, her eyes darting to the collapsed emperor, or was it former emperor, on the floor and the incandescent huling. Yes, on the dragon of China. Her voice didn't quaver, and I gave her points for that. I choose you to be the child of heaven, to lead China to greatness. There was a soft murmur of words that didn't sound polite. The woman, Shi Shi, dropped to her knees, her head touching the marble floor in front of the dragon. Great dragon of China, I am but a daughter of concubine. I am not of the royal family. Her protest sounded terrified, and if she could see the looks being cast her way, she had a right to be. Your father was the new he. That makes you of the Qin dynasty. You and your children will lead China to the next great adventure. She is not worthy. Chia Shane had managed to get to his feet, and the age difference between them surprised me. Chia Shane must have been in his late fifties. I revised my estimate of the woman. She might be in her thirties. Their father must have been active late. Tia Ting turned his head to stare at the man, mage no longer. I say she is worthy. I am the dragon of China, and I choose. God, kill them. Carely intensed as he translated this, and I snapped up my dust and bioelectric shield, expecting a hail of bullets. No! She, she had sprung to her feet, protecting the dragon with her body. No one may harm him. Her face glowed with conviction. The guards had guns up and were wavering. Their ruler, the challenger, and the others, all pulling at their loyalties. Cowards, I am the emperor. Chia Xing grabbed one of the guard's guns and pointed it at the dragon, and even I knew he was about to pull the trigger. The dragon of China is China. Xi Xi almost screamed that, and I sensed, or felt, or maybe it was tasted, the magic snap out of her. The bottom half inch of her hair vaporized, and Chia Xing gasped, eyes wide. Then he just crumpled like a puppet with his strings cut. Shi Shi stood straight and proud. No one will threaten him while I breathe. The room had fallen completely silent, and everyone stared at the girl. And this is why I choose you. He leaned down, his whiskers wrapping around her, and he breathed on her upturned face. My tattoos had been put on by the office of the OMO, and I thought they did that here too. But as I watched, hers changed. Before, she had been strong in pattern and soul as a Merlin. Now, transform went from pale to strong. I frowned, then remembered that a familiar not only lowered your costs, but gave you another strong. I reached up to touch my vivid tattoo. I had more than anyone else. And frankly, it would have been nice some days to not be so odd. But I wouldn't give up Joe, Sable, or Carolian for anything. It is done. Long live Empress Sisi of the Qin Dynasty. Tia Tang's voice rang through the great hall. All around them, people were kneeling and bowing. I kept my eyes on the dais. The body of Chia Xing lay there, a crumpled heap of flesh, the ministers shifted and kept glancing at Hui Ling. Her face was an impassive mask. Then she bowed deeply to Shi Shi, who stood looking more than a bit bewildered. Long live the Empress.
That was the trigger, and everyone else bowed, and the ramifications hit me. A dragon, a realm denizen, had just changed the leader of a country. Had he changed it to a maternal lineage as well? Tietang, I whispered, having no desire to speak out loud, not as the only foreigner witness to this. I'd be happy if they forgot I was ever here, though from the smoldering hate in various eyes, I doubted that would ever happen. Yes, Harold. I resisted growling. This smacked of Tursane and Esmir corrupting him, but I let it be. If you are done with me, I really think I would like to return. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you for your time. This was important and I promise to explain later. Please. I let it go and poked Kirlian. Ready? Very. Meet you in the break room. I started to say yes, then thought about it. Can you check out the conference room? See if there is a safe place for me to step. I'd like to make it look like Tieting returned me and keep me doing this easily confidential. Yes. He disappeared, and a minute later an image popped into my head. With a deep breath, I sidestepped away from the drama into chaos. Chapter 32 Section 1.142.3b All staff to diplomats must declare their status. However, those that never leave the boundaries of their embassy are not required to make declarations. Emergencies that occur while on embassy grounds are exempt from testing. People were yelling, security was there, and the doors were thrown open. I stumbled a bit and hit the wall. Stepping that distance without an emotional spike was harder than I thought. Half the room spun to look at me, guards with guns drawn. The rest jumped away from me. Silence fell as we all stared at each other. It wasn't broken until Carolyn jumped up on the conference table and started grooming his balls. That had everyone relaxing a bit, and Pearl had a vaguely familiar man headed my way as everyone else stared at me, then started to exit the room half of them on their phones. By the time they grabbed me and sat me in a chair, most of the room was empty except for the security man, Pearl, Carolyn, and Scott. He was at the far side of the room, staring at his computer, but if he actually saw anything, I'd be surprised. Lorison is on his way here. Explain what happened. Striven ordered, and I stared at him until I recognized him from when I got my badge. Merlin, was that only a week ago? I licked my lips, exhaustion slamming into me. What did you see? Pearl and Strippant looked at each other, then over at Scott. Yang, get over here, the lieutenant ordered. Scott closed his laptop and moved over, his gaze even more stiff and jerky than usual. His eyes were glazed over, and he sat down, staring at nothing. Repeat what you saw. The crisp order came from Pearl this time, but my eyes were on Scott, alarm bells going off in my mind. She was there, then the dragon. It filled the room. Then it grabbed her and was gone, as was she and her cat. They were just gone. Poof. His words were mechanical even for him. Now explain- Striven started. I held up my hand, still watching Scott. Have neither of you two noticed he is in shock? Scott sat there, his breathing shallow, and I could see his skin was getting gray. They turned to look at him. Oh, for Merlin's sake. Strivent muttered and was on his phone. I need a med team up here, stut. Shock reaction to magic. Pearl groaned and rubbed her temple. I think she might have glared at me if she wasn't dealing with this emergency. I watched Scott until med personnel showed up and took the time granted to gather my thoughts and make sure I understood the ramifications of what I'd seen. Can all focuses make someone a mage? I sent to Carolyn. If I piss you off, can you take my magic away? You are a herald. I can't do that. I kept my head down, resisting glaring at him. Having anyone guess I was having an argument with him would be counterproductive. If I wasn't a herald, could you? Could Georgas have made James a non-mage? Carolyn focused very hard on hind paws, the noise of his grooming a counterpoint to the EMT's chattering. Kirlian! Mentally shouting was hard, 
but this changed everything if it was true. He glanced up at me and curled into himself a bit. Tia Tang was rash. It should not have been public like that. I bounced on that bit of information, feeling rather like a cath myself. So familiars or focuses can grant and remove magic? No. Yes. In a way. Kirlian! I managed to hiss his name, but then Pearl and Strivent were headed back in my direction. We will finish talking about this at home. He slunk off the table and disappeared under it. I suspected he was talking to Esmir or others, but this time I would not let it drop. So the dragon grabbed you and... Striven said as he dropped down in the chair next to me. I took a deep breath and stuck to the barest facts. I think he pulled me to China, the royal palace, as the emperor and the people I think make up his court were there. China? They asked almost as one. I shrugged. I didn't check my GPS or go outside and look, but it looked like China, as did the people. They grunted and waved me to go on. He said he would choose a new emperor and drained the magic from Chiaxing. He what? Pearl blurted, her face paling. Oh, it gets better. He, being the dragon, drained the magic, refused to choose Hui Ling, and instead he chose the child of one of the concubines to be the next emperor. Empress? A female. Chiaxing then tried to kill us, or them, not really sure who he was going to kill. And the new empress, Shishi, I think, killed him. Tia Tang then chose her and filled in one of her branches. She is now strong in soul, pattern, and transform. I swallowed and held up a hand before they could say anything. The really surprising part is the dragon of China. I said it like that purposefully so they could get the impact. Announced her children would be the rulers of China. Pearl looked polaxed, while Strivent looked a bit confused. What is the big deal about that? I thought China had always followed the royal family. It took a minute for Pearl to respond. They have, but always through the male line. If the dragon supports this, China might become a matriarchal society or government. Strivent shrugged. Okay, so why did he want you? There weren't any mages in the room, so I went with the simple truth. He wanted me to witness it because of my status. He knew me. I hoped they'd assume I meant my double Merlin status or State Department employment. They both seemed to accept it, though I thought Pearl was more wrapped up in what this change actually meant than hearing what I said. And you aren't harmed? Strippen asked. I thought about that answer carefully. Harmed? No. Stressed, exhausted, a bit off balance, but there was no harm done to me. At least as long as I didn't count my shattered patience and understanding of my place in the world. Lieutenant Striven sighed and snapped his notebook closed. Mrs. Togashi, as she wasn't actually abducted by the government and she was returned within an hour unharmed, I do not know what you want me to do. Even if you decide to lodge a formal complaint to China, that is more in your arena of power than mine. Pearl looked up from the table, glanced at me, then at the lieutenant. I agree. For now, it's best if we let this go. There will be enough fallout once the ramifications of this leak out. And right now, I suspect we are the only non-Chinese nationals who know. So I'm not spreading the news. Her voice was flat, and she stared at me. Not like I know anyone important who would understand the consequences, I said, as opposed to promising anything. I would be talking this over tonight with my friends and family, but who would we tell? She grunted and went to stand. Pearl? She paused and looked at me. Where is Chen Wen? He was here when you were taken? She asked, an odd note in her voice. Yes, we were talking about how I should not be involved. Something about a bad look? Pearl stared at me and shrugged. I am not going to worry about it now. There's no telling what his new master will want. She heaved herself to her feet and lumbered to the door. Take the rest of the day off. Keep your mouth shut. See me when you get in tomorrow. The conference room door shut behind her as she said the last words. I stared at the wall and thought about his lie and Hui Lang's anger. 
I wasn't sure the emperor was his master, and I doubted Hui Lang was going to take this setback lying down. I needed to talk to Carolyn and everyone else to figure out what to do. If anything, I couldn't really save the world, and most days I didn't think the world wanted to be saved. Let's grab my stuff and get home. We have a lot to talk about, I said to Carolyn, my voice laden with meeting. He chuffed as he slunk out from under the table. <sighs> you will not like it. This does not surprise me. Come on. Fifteen minutes later, we were back at the apartment. I had changed into something more comfortable. It was only 11.30. It seemed much later. I got some sweet tea and settled down in my chair in my bedroom and stared at him. Caroline was sprawled out, pretending not to care, but his tail gave him away. It rat a tatted on the floor at a frantic pace. Can you cause a person to emerge? Me personally? No. Carolyn, I warned, my stress bubbling at the back of my mind. I can't. I was never given to magic. I just didn't want to be like the litters before. Either dead or hunters that never bothered to use their brains or magic because it was too much work. I forced. His tone changed and his entire body went limp. I saw the opening near you, and I chose. It is possible. I just didn't know when you choose after an initial emergence and come from the realms at the same time it can trigger one. The problem is, you should have never been merely a Merlin. What? That made no sense to me. Merely? Merlin was more powerful than I knew what to do with. You were chosen early to be a herald. Heralds have all the branches in all classes. You should have been that. But I sensed you when I searched for a mage. I wanted your fire, compassion, your empathy. I wanted to be better than my siblings. He didn't look at me. In fact, he'd rolled over so he couldn't see me at all. I parsed what he said. And the other familiars? Those that are gifted to magic watch and find a soul they resonate with. They then can force an emergence with their appearance. It felt like I was dragging the information out of him. Gifted? You mean like those babies during the trial? The colossal mistake I had made thinking sacrifice to magic meant killed. Especially, my mind caught on the Gorgon looking up at me. Someone can have a Gorgon as a familiar? Eh, he murmured. Generally, those that are magic and humanoids simply become lords like Esmir, given enough time. The Gorgon would probably work with Tursene in a century or two, while the Cath and Jeterian would become familiars. Though I suppose it is possible for a human to get a Gorgon familiar. Though unlikely, the human mage would die of old age before the child became old enough to speak. He sounded thoughtful but that didn't answer my question. Carolyn, I prodded, and he flinched, his tail lashing harder. Yes, if we try hard enough, we can choose someone, and the act of us entering this realm can nudge them to emerge if they already have the ability to become a mage. Are you ever wrong? I suppose it's possible, but I am unaware of that ever happening. He demurred. So Tiatang can really pull magic from someone? even though he wasn't magic gifted? I tried to balance it all in my head, and Carolyn growled. I thought I heard a whisper of words in my mind that sounded like stupid dragon, but wasn't sure. There are focuses, and then there are focuses, he finally said. As he spoke, he curled up tight in a ball, and I suspected he was getting ready to pretend he was too tired to talk. And what does that mean? I demanded exasperated. There were days where I didn't know if I was treading on religious taboos or state secrets. It was about to drive me crazy. He lifted his head and gave me an incredulous look. I know I am impressive and magnificent, but I don't compare either in magic or prestige to a dragon, a phoenix, or a unicorn. All of them are cross-realm beings. Cath, all felines really are chaos. All canids are spirit, all insects are order, as are most avians. But those three and few others are all realms. They are 
for lack of a better word, Merlin's by nature. At best, I am a wizard by your ranking. My link with you, being your focus, lifts me up as I lift you. But those... He paused and buried his head under his tail. Those are... our superstars. I fell silent and let him be. I had much to think about, and no clue what it meant for me or mine. Chapter 33 Section 1.2 Serving in the draft is regarded as similar to military service and all mages, magician, and above, are held to it. They shall be notified upon testing as to their status, and a draft officer will be assigned to monitor them. Being home so early, I decided I could cook, but I sent a message to ask Charles to come over. Something he had mentioned in passing made me want to ask more questions. I told him to bring his laptop. Since even now my ability to cook was basic, I might not cast a Murphy's cloak anymore, but I still managed to make every mistake and mess possible. I went for something simple. I had steaks marinating and ready to cook and salad and potatoes done by the time everyone showed up. Hey, Joe said as she walked in, looking less worn out than last week. You're home early. I made a face, and she paused. Uh-oh, that look means nothing good. It means a story when everyone is here. I responded. She gave me a sideways look, then scanned me up and down as if looking for wounds. Well, you seem unarmed, and since you aren't in hysterics, I assume our favorite cat is fine. I rolled my eyes. Just for that, you can cook the steaks. Go. And yes, I have one ready for him so you can sear it and he'll be happy. Joe winked at me and headed back to shower and change. While she wasn't covered in mud this time, really, how did she end up in a job where she got to wear jeans and boots all the time? She was still dusty and hot. Sable showed up a few minutes later, also wearing jeans, though a nicer shirt. Corey! Oh, potatoes! <gasps> yes. Then she paused and looked at me. Ah, store time tonight. She glanced at the table. And Charles is coming. Okay, I'll put on real clothes. Oops, tell Joe that. I forgot. Both of them had a tendency to wear as little as possible at home, meaning short shorts and a tank top. There was no reason to flaunt skin in front of Charles. He was a friend, not someone to tease. By the time they emerged, Charles had arrived. The small indoor grill was heated up, the tables set with everything else, and we laughed and talked as Joe seared everything to perfection. Carolian's was raw, of course. We had taken to keeping mealworms in the fridge, and Arachina was more than happy to have four of them for her meal. Okie spill, Cory. What's going on? Joe finally prodded as we finished up the last of the steak. Charles settled back to listen while Arachina nestled in the ever-present hood of the hoodie he wore. I groaned. Ugh. You remember that comment about it being between China and Japan as to who wanted to kill me more? I think China is in the lead. I spent the next 15 minutes explaining everything. When I was done, they all stared at me, then at the two familiars who I swear were practicing invisibility. Then they looked back at me. I really don't know if I should be impressed or horrified, Joe admitted. Not everyone can add dethroning an emperor to their resume. Hey, that was all Tia Tang, not me, I protested. Yet, you were the one he dragged there. Seems to me you're going to get all the glory and the infamy. Joe smirked at me, and I threw my napkin at her. She caught it, of course, and used it to wipe her lips. So what now? I mean, while it's cool and kind of freaky, I'm not sure how much of a role you're going to play. That twigged the train of thought about how all of this had to have a puppet master behind it. Even if I couldn't figure out why, the only one I could think of was freedom from magic. I turned to Charles. Remember when we were discussing the various politicians and how they all seemed to be backed by Freedom Foundation? He nodded, his light eyes watching me. I could never tell what he was thinking, but where Alexant was all snap judgments and annoyance, Charles was methodical, careful in his thoughts, even more so in his actions. I'm wondering if they are more than we think. 
I spoke slowly, still trying to work my way through everything. Is there a chance they are behind Freedom from Magic 2? And have they been getting unexpected funding lately? Charles gave me a funny look. I have info on that. Let me grab it. He got up and grabbed his laptop from his bag. Sable and I cleared the dishes while he connected and logged in. We cleaned the kitchen while he typed away. So get this. Freedom Foundation is a nonprofit, so they have to report their donations and income from any fundraisers. In the last 15 years, they have had multiple donations from anonymous donors, all for between five and $9,000 each time, multiple times a month. And what does that mean? I didn't have a clue, but from the look on his face, I thought it must mean something. There's a lot of laws about this, but if I understand it correctly, if it is under 10000 they don't need to report who it is. And since they are all anonymous and probably come from different accounts... He shrugged. I'm a data person, not a tax law person, but that's what I've heard. So I find it odd they have so many donations that are under that amount. I sat back thinking about it, but it didn't really tell me anything. I don't suppose you can tell me where the money is from. Not without a warrant and a lot more access. He said, looking at me. And I'd much rather not end up in jail. He said dryly. I raised my hands in surrender. Agreed. I just don't understand any of this. Well, lay out the parts, Sable suggested. What do we know? Maybe then we can figure out who to take it to. Because as much as I love being a crime fan and team, she made air quotes as she talked. I don't really think there is some guy running around in a mask we can pull off. I snickered. <laughs> no, probably not. Okay, I can go over what I know, but I'm leaving out the stuff from familiars and magic as a force. I don't think it's part of this conspiracy. Or more accurately, if it is, we're all in big trouble and should prepare to die. They snorted at that, and I got up to grab a notebook. I wanted to write it down to see if that made it clearer in my head. I talked and wrote at the same time. We know there is a concerted effort both by our government and by someone else to kill mages, preferably before they have kids. Just saying the words out loud gave me chills. We know Japan wants something in Wells' research, but not what. China has a minister of magic that may or may not be involved. We know Freedom Foundation supports the majority of senators in office. And representatives. I checked. They all have significant donations from FF. Charles interjected, and I added that to my list. What else do we know? Joe was leaning forward and staring at the list. I don't know if them trying to twist the draft is separate or part of the killing mages aspect. And why is Japan involved in the treaty? Is the medicine they come up with that good? Why have a treaty for it? Why not just sell or patent it? I sat back, thinking. That is a very good question. Medicine gets patented all the time. Why not just patent it? If you didn't want to share, you have years to sit on it or charge a fortune. Japan controls all their mages? Sable asked. I think so. The Empress's handmaidens for the women, and the Emperor's servants for the men. Why? Well, if mages develop this working for the Emperor, maybe they don't follow the normal rules? I shrugged. It could be. I looked at the list. It really doesn't seem like much. I mean, we have the numbers and know they are real, but everything else is a conversation Carolian overheard and what Tia Tang told us, which could be things that were misinterpreted or even code for something else. If someone brought this to me, I'd shrug and say, life sucks, people die. I paused. Okay, I wouldn't say that, but other than my fear, there isn't anything to act on, and the numbers are just that. Numbers not proofs of murder or anything else. I sank back with a sigh and stared at it. Am I making things up? The three of them all stared at my paltry list. No, I don't think so, Charles said when the silence had almost become uncomfortable. While the draft board manipulating you is one thing, it isn't illegal, and I'd be very surprised if it didn't happen on a regular basis. Remember I said I needed my notes? You asked me about who backed the Freedom for Magic group. Well, I did some research and found out that they are actually under FF, and that took a lot of digging. 
But what is really interesting is that FF has been around since about 1875, and the president of that organization was a senator, one Claude Beaumont, and he sponsored the No Mage official law. We all looked at him, then back at the information I listed. Really? We doing conspiracy theories? Joe asked, frowning at the paper. I get people not liking us because we can use magic, but really, for most of us, we don't use it that often. Joe looked around, frowning and thinking about it. I mean, I use it at work quite a bit, but it is structured and specific. Things that to do any other way would be really expensive or hard. She must have seen our questioning frowns because she clarified. If something breaks in the dam, in a crawl spaces, or even where there is a tiny amount of clearance, to do it manually, we'd have to pull it all apart, then patch it up. We are talking many feet of concrete, making a space big enough for a human to get into, possible flooding. It could be really bad. But instead, I go down there with backup. She said that strongly, glaring at Sable, who smirked at her. There was a story there, one I didn't know. I added it to my figure-out-at-a-later-point list. I run a small camera in there, and I can transform it back to whatever we need before it broke. So for half an inch of hair, I save millions. It's one of the reasons so many public works budgets are so low. Sable nodded. She's right. I do similar things, and the filtration system I design needs a mage to run it. But still, for tiny offerings, it cleans water up at pennies on the gallon instead of dollars. Joe nodded at Sable. But here? At home? She looked around. I think I've seen Sable use our magic to light up a candle or heat up the massage oil. I occasionally will pull heat out of a drink to cool it, but otherwise I rarely use magic at home. Most mages are like that. We use it at work because we are taught to, but cooking? She shrugged. If I think it needs to cool down faster, I might have air rush across it, but it's just as easy to put in the fridge for 10 minutes. Why fear us when outside of work we almost never use it? We all fell silent, looking at my notebook and then each other. I know not if it matters, Carolyn said, and from the way everyone stiffened, I knew he'd spoken to all of us. I turned to look at him. He lay on the floor, close enough to see us easily, but not so much we would bump him getting up from the table. Tia Tang and I talk. He says Hui Lang lies, not to Shishi, but her words, while true, are not honest. Her anger is palpable, but he has not called her on it. Shishi is worried, but she can't change anything yet. It will take time to have her power base solidify, and Hui Lang has sat in this position like a Chitarian on a web for decades. The images of the angry woman I'd seen plucking strings and manipulating things struck me as wholly accurate, if not creepy. Any idea what she is manipulating? Charles asked. Carolyn flicked his tail. Everything? Nothing. Humans care about things that make little sense, but she still doesn't realize that all familiars speak all the languages. She has mentioned something about changing the world for the new year. She is also very close to the train minister. Tia Tang says he thinks they are having sexual relations. The way he delivered the information made me smile, but what it implied worried me. I swear, Corey, Charles said, leaning back and giving me a long, level look. You managed to either stumble across a conspiracy involving high-ranking politicians in multiple countries or a bunch of players that have nothing to do with each other and not a darn thing we can do about any of it. You're right. No one would look at what we have and do anything. I sighed and tapped my fingers on my water glass. I get what China wants, I think. I see what FF wants. But what does Japan want? To be left alone? Sable murmured. What? My head jerked up at that. What do you mean? Japan was always a bit xenophobic, Anything not of their culture and people was to be regarded with fear. I remember being in Okinawa with Dad and the way they just pulled away from him and me. I don't look much like my mom, and they always treated all of us like we were wild animals that might attack at any moment. I think Japan would be happier if they were isolated from the rest of the world. 
That thought stayed with me for the rest of the evening, though we didn't come to any decisions. That thought wouldn't go away. Chapter 34 Section 1.3.2 While serving under the draft, all mages are expected to hold themselves to the highest level of morality. Misdemeanors and infractions may carry heavier penalties. I spent the evening flipping through the binder, trying to get my head wrapped around the sheer breadth of what James had researched. Some of them were a few notes and something along the lines of, well, that was a dead end, and there wasn't anything else. Others seemed like he had spent years on it. How old had he been? The one with the most research was something he called a water wall that he had used mostly as an amusement when he hiked, but he had put a lot of work into it. Most of his notes had reams of comments. This particular invention had reams of math. I glanced at them, curious. This was a created spell or effect, I guessed, but only a Merlin with water, air, and entropy could do it. That limited it to a few Merlins, though I didn't see why multiple archmages working together couldn't do it. But the math and the offering would be complicated. Keeping it up for an hour or even a day wouldn't be an issue, but if the math was correct, most mages would be out of available offerings in a few months. Morning came too early, and I slipped an extra thermos of coffee in my bag. I wasn't up to their pod coffee today. Carolyn said he'd be there later unless I called, and he curled back up, though I suspected he planned on visiting his mother and the others today. Either way, I sidestep in at my normal time, but the office was empty. I liked it empty. I settled down and pulled up the information on China, along with training videos I was getting nagged about watching. I watched the videos, but I thought more about the problems and if there really was one. I had to believe there was. Percentages didn't increase that much without a cause. I glanced at the clock and frowned. It showed 8.03. The office was still quiet. While I normally was here a bit after 7.00, Usually, Pearl beat me in, or was here a minute or two later. While two weeks wasn't much time to establish everyone's patterns, I found this unusual. A moment of doubt hit me, and I double-checked the calendar. Nope, it was Tuesday. I shook my head and started up one of the harassment videos again, when the loud speaker went off over my head. Corey Monroe, if you are in the building, please call extension 311. Repeat. Corey Monroe, please call extension 311. It was a woman's voice, but I could hear the tension in her voice. What in the world? Why didn't they just call my desk? I hit pause on the video and picked up the phone, dialing the extension. Yes, a tense voice answered, not the same one that had spoken over the loudspeakers. This is Corey Monroe. I had no idea what was going on. Oh, good. Please come down to the lobby immediately. Her voice changed to relieved, then stressed again. Is there an issue? I asked, confused and looking for my phone. Just come to the lobby immediately, Merlin Moreau. She snapped, and I could now hear fear in her voice. Leaving now. I hung up, made sure my phone was in my pocket, and my badge was clearly clipped. Just in case, I grabbed my coffee and topped it up. This sounded like caffeine might be needed. The emptiness of the building registered as I headed to the elevators, and they opened for me, and I stepped in, enjoying the smooth downward flow. The doors slid open, and two guards were standing there, guns drawn, pointing at me. Freaked out, I reached, pulling luck over me as I added moisture to their primers, something I'd been practicing, and slammed my back against the wall so I wasn't immediately visible. I started to grab for electricity to throw at them as I tried to figure out where to go. Stepping seemed the best option. Retreat was always the best option. Merlin Monroe, it's okay. This is Lieutenant Stribbent. Please come out. The voice was familiar, and fleeing at the moment seemed counterproductive. Still holding Lady Luck tight around me, I stuck my head out. The guards had put their guns away and seemed a bit sheepish. The lieutenant stood there, glaring at me. 
Yes? Exactly how did you get in the building? I checked the records. The last time you swiped in was days ago, but people reported seeing you at your desk, and the logins confirmed it, but I have no record of you going through security. Oops. Marlon, I didn't think about that. I responded with the super intelligent, um, trying to think of a truthful answer. I would have to make very sure from here on out. I stepped to a place down the road and walked in, going through security. Now that it occurred to me, I could have caused major problems. That bit of guilt had me hunching a little more in shame. He shook his head, eyes hard. I'll address that later. For right now, come with me. He pivoted on one heel with the expected military precision and headed to the front. The entire situation made no sense, so after double-checking no one was pointing a gun at me, I followed. I kept my pace at a steady walk. I refused to scurry and followed him through into the lobby. Oddly, there still wasn't anyone there besides a few guards, all of whom looked freaked out. In the middle of the lobby, relatively dark due to the tinted windows, he stopped and stared at me. What? At this point, I had no idea what was going on, and I was about to sidestep out of there, even if it gave away too much. Someone wants to speak with you and is refusing to let anyone in until they have. I looked at him confused. He glared at me and jerked his arm toward the lobby windows. I followed it and had to focus to see through the tinting then stopped. On the other side of the glass, in the large area where people would walk up from the parking, the metro, or being dropped off, was a large western-style dragon. The dragon's wings were half-mantled, and I could see people milling about on the other side. A large crowd, in fact, and I had a bad feeling I knew who it was. Are you kidding me? I muttered, but a bit too loud. I do not joke about stuff like this, and I'm absolutely not kidding that I want that blasted dragon off of my entryway. His face had flushed red, and a vein throbbed in his temple. Carolyn, I sent as I stared at the dragon. Mm -hmm. He murmured in a sleepy purr in my mind. The glare Strivent gave me convinced me I should start moving in that direction. A fortifying swig of coffee didn't help. At this rate, I was going to need to go to the higher octane stuff. Maybe make my coffee out of caffeinated water? Is there a reason that Smog is crouched outside my work building? Nope. Wait, did you just say Smog is there? Yes, I whispered as I pushed through the door. The odd tension-filled silence caught me as I went through, but the rush of cars and noise of DC surrounded it. I felt like I was in the eye of a hurricane. The door clanged shut behind me, and a flash of pain and then pressing heat let me relax a bit as Carolyn pushed against my leg. I didn't look down at him. All my attention focused on the dragon whose head was turning to look at me, but I brushed my hand along Carolyn's skull, feeling ears laid back and a low rumble that wasn't a purr. In the dark in Albany, she seemed big, maybe the size of an elephant. Sitting here in broad daylight, I could already see news vans on the street. She looked like the size of a Learjet. Her scales of bright green and pink blue shimmered in the morning heat. Then there were her wings. Tiatang didn't have wings, and Banyarls were bird-like, and I'd never gotten a close look at Elzebas. If anything, I'd say they resembled the wings of the manticore, except where his had been the color of peach skin, hers were the color of rubies on a thick skin that at a glance brought to mind neoprene, though I'd never seen a dive suit that was ruby red. Either way, you couldn't look away from her. It wasn't just the color or the size or even the teeth that were longer than my forearm. It was everything. Majesty, awe, power, beauty, magic. They were all rolled up in this creature, and I had no doubt she'd landed here to make a statement. The problem was, I had no idea what statement that might be. Zmog, you wanted to talk to me. Ah, finally you've shown yourself. 
This place is much changed from the days of kings and knights. She looked around. It smells much worse and has noise that makes no sense. You could have just... Ow! I glared down at Kirlian, who sunk his claws into my calf. What was that for? I demanded. His claws hurt. He whispered fiercely in my mind. Words meant just for me. Cory, do not snark off to the dragon that can fry you with a breath. I blinked at him as he stared up at me. Emerald eyes almost invisible, his pupils were so dilated. My attention shifted to Zmog, who waited, looking at me. Dragon faces don't lend well to human expressions. Cats are much easier to read if you look at their body language. But I swear by Merlin, she was smirking at me and taunting me at the same time. So, Lord Zmog, what did you need to talk to me about? Regardless of anything else, I had no doubt she was a lord, though of chaos, spirit, or order, I had no clue. My youngest, though magic may have taken Teatang before I would have proved, do not think I do not love that dragon. Her words had warnings, and from the way everyone was looking at us, breath held, I figured they could all hear her responses. But why broadcast? I would never think that. The joy you showed when he was found bellied that thought ever forming. I wanted to snort at my own speech pattern, but something about smog made you want to be more formal flowery. News videos rolled, and I could see the flash, hear the click of cell phones documenting this. Oh well, people wanted proof there were dragons. This was definitely proof. They were going to blame me. I just knew it. That is wise. But I would talk to you in private. I, however, have more manners than my child. Would you be willing to speak to me in private? Your focus, of course, may attend. I looked at all the people around us, watching with avid, hungry eyes. That would be my pleasure, Lord. I switched to mind speech. If you don't mind, could you take me with you as opposed to me following? I kept the comment private. She, however, did not keep her response private, and I cringed at the idea of all the people hearing this. And how in the realms would you find where I wish to talk to you if I did not open the way? Her front arm reached out, and claws longer than my forearm wrapped around me. I have faith your focus can find you. Her hand, paw, something squeezed around me, and reality disappeared before I had time to scream. Chapter 35, Section 95.20 All updates to the OMO must come through approved channels. The relationship between the government and the OMO shall be upheld through the highest level. The penalty for destabilization of this relationship will be extreme. It felt like I sidestepped mixed with a planar rip, but I was the one tearing. The need to scream bubbled up inside me, but before I could inhale to scream, it stopped. I stood, swaying on my feet, eyes closed as I concentrated on not throwing up. That was not nice, Smog. Carolyn all but snarled, and his growl of annoyance was audible as I swayed in place. I am not nice. I am tempted to eat her, but then she could not answer our questions. I recognized Smog's voice and forced my eyes open. My desire to be eaten was non-existent. The sky overhead was a reddish gray, and I swear there was a volcano smoking in the distance. My feet shifted on the grainy gray-brown dirt where I stood. The lack of moisture in the air sucked away my breath as I fought to believe what I saw. It was the first non-lush space I'd seen in the realms, I figured various creatures would prefer different landscapes. What I hadn't expected was the conclave of dragons perched on rocks, laying on the sands, and sitting up, all staring at me. Um. I looked around at the variety of dragons. There had been one assignment in the history of magic about magical creatures, and it had covered the major ones, though suspected but not proven, and dragons. It had talked about wyverns, worms, 
and the difference between Western and Eastern-style dragons. There was no proof of any dragon beside the Dragon of China. None of their theories prepared me for the variety of dragons eyeing me like I looked at coffee, deciding if it was edible. Some were the colors of metals, bronze, gold, copper, steel, but others were the colors of fire or water. I don't think there was a single color in existence I couldn't find in their forms. I had expected them all to have scales like Tietang or Zmog, but some had leathery hide, and a few, those higher on the rocks, seemed to have feathers. In any other situation, I would be bursting with excitement and asking questions. As it was, I still expected to be killed any moment. Smog may not have had her claws still around me, but I knew she was right behind me. Her snorts of hot breath on the nape of my neck told me that. Carolyn? I swear my mental voice squeaked, but I was trying to figure out where to sidestep to, either Hamadia or home. But if they followed me and could breathe fire, those points sounded like horrible ideas. I needed to get more safe spots. Hawaii on the volcano sounded good, or maybe the middle of the ocean. I took a shaky breath and tried to decide if I needed to run for my life or bring up earth shields. At least with all the dirt here, I can make myself an igloo. The image of me hiding in a dirt igloo while trying to cook me made me smile until I realized it would be like a kiln and would just cook me. Is this the one? An unknown voice spoke, and I stood frozen in indecision. How much trouble would I get in for killing dragons? Could you kill dragons? Yes, she's the one magic called. Tarsain and Salastra think she is the herald. There was a level of derision there that had my back stiffening. Anger and annoyance cleared up my fear, as usual. Ah, screw it. They would try to kill me or they wouldn't. But I'm a dragon too. I turned to glare at Smog. I would like to point out you brought me here. And if you have issues with what Tursane or Salastra said, I have no issue asking them to join us here, and you can take it up with them. I glared at her as I prepared to flee. There was a collective intake of breath, and I reached for water and air. Water didn't like it here, but it existed, and if I needed to, I'd suck the moisture out of their bodies and soak the place with it. We had avoided getting tested again after our joining, no one wanted to take the chance the differences could be detected, but I knew I could pull on water and air much easier than before. One dragon perched on a rock rose to his full height and jumped toward me. Don't flinch, Carolyn hissed in my mind. Locking my knees, I watched the dragon soar toward me. It had scales the color of lava, rippling from red-black to flame yellow from his head and spine, down to his tail and claws. The yellow ended where Talon's black as obsidian jutted out. It landed about five yards from me, kicking up so much dust, I called on air to blow it away from me. There were too many medical studies on what particulates did to your lungs to make me want to breathe in any of that. It stuck its head toward me. The head alone was more than half my height, the red-black scales around eyes of blue flame would have been stunning if I didn't need to worry about it biting me in half. Arrogant thing, isn't it? The voice rumbled, as if coming from the depths of the earth, and I stared back at him. No, not really. But if you're going to accuse me of things that I did not choose, I'd rather have you talk to the people you're really annoyed at. Zmog laughed from behind me, and a few of the other dragons chuckled. At least two had trickles of flame flickering out of their noses. I wasn't sure if that was cool, terrifying, or both. We should just eat her. She would be a small snack prior to hunting. I wasn't sure who said that, but it didn't matter. What is with it with you denizens and eating humans? There will be no eating of me, and if you want to bitch at Salastra and Tursane, Merlin, if you want to include Bob, feel free. I am not in any way, shape, or form responsible for their actions. At this point, I could feel my heart pounding as well as my head. What do you want me to do? 
Carolyn whispered. I can go get Esmir. I shook my head a little. My own annoyance had gotten the better of my desire to flee. They could go jump in a volcano if they thought they could push me around just because I was human. I got that enough from humans. They know my opinion. Besides, once you are dead, what would they do? Smog said, and I could hear the challenge in her voice. Besides, you are just a mage, a human, and fragile. The heat behind me shifted, and I moved. One of the awesome things about this situation was I didn't need to worry about collateral damage, hurting innocence, or property damage. They, also, probably didn't realize I could use fire and water, too. But it didn't matter. I flicked my hand at Carolyn and I grabbed time. I set myself out of the flow by about 30 seconds and sprinted away from Zmog. Carolyn had already bounded away in two huge leaps. I raced to him, dropped time, absorbing the cost with barely a shudder, and I did a blast of disrupt thought. As I saw multiple dragons shake their heads, aborting actions, I called Earth. Massive clefts appeared in the ground under the various dragons, and those on rocks had their entire perch drop into the ground. At the same time, I used call mineral, latching onto iron, and offered a full inch of hair to have it go straight down. We had discovered years ago that most of the denizens had blood with iron in it, but pulling these minuscule amounts took a lot of offering, and I spent it without blinking. All of this happened in about 30 seconds, making me glad I'd been practicing things to do, and it made it so much easier that I didn't care about all the side effects. Guilt lived with me because it was so much easier to kill than to do almost anything else with magic. There might be offensive magic skills taught to the rogue hunters, but other than the soul yank, I didn't know a quick way to disable people, and I was never sure I wouldn't kill them. My life would be easier if I was a psychopath. The thought made me smirk, but I kept my eyes on the landscape and the damage I had just done. They all lay in holes, dirt pulled over them in some cases as the walls of the holes caved in. Low moans and a screech or two broke the silence. You dare? Smog hissed in my mind and I crossed my arms to stare at her where she struggled in the hole created by my magic, call mineral making it almost impossible for her to move. You grabbed me and threatened to eat me. Yes, I dare. I was ready to sidestep if I needed to, but backing down would do me no good. And if you keep up this rudeness, I will rip every bit of moisture out of your eyeballs and leave you blind forever. I kept my voice laden with a threat, that I meant from the bottom of my soul. If flame should shoot from her eyes, Zmog would have roasted me. She started to struggle to get out of the hole. I wouldn't struggle too much. I have the iron in your blood pulling down. I haven't told it to rupture cell walls, but I can. I warned her, still a bit peeved. We were having a glaring contest, and I wondered if my next move was going to be killing dragons or spending my entire life running from them. Either way, the idea sounded sucky. Laughter, rich, gravelly laughter that sounded like the earth herself was chortling, rolled through my skull, making me flinch. <laughs> Give it up, Zmog. She won't run or back down. Plus, this hole is uncomfortable, and I'd like to climb out. It was the voice that I was pretty sure belonged to the dragon that was all the colors of lava. I pivoted to see him trying to shake dirt off his head. Excuse me? Dragons, spat Carolyn, the verbal part a long hiss. They love to play games. Amusing coming from a cat who plays with everything. Pax Corasand Monroe, there will be no more threats. No need you fear your existence here. Smog sounded gentler, and more like the dragon I had met the other night, not the one who had been busy terrifying me for the last few minutes. I glanced at Carolyn, who had dropped his butt and sat staring at claws covered in black dust. I'm going to need a bath, he whined. That told me more than anything to let them go. 
I stopped calling the iron, something that had been a slow but steady drain on me. I had to keep providing tiny offerings to keep coal mineral active. Then I had to concentrate to encourage the iron to go toward the center of the earth instead of coming to me. A long sigh of relief and multiple dragons rose out of holes, shaking themselves to clear off the dirt that now covered them. They had been deep in some cases. I stayed way back, fully prepared to step to Atlanta if I needed to, but Zmog shook herself free and climbed out. Want to start explaining? She snapped her wings out once, twice, creating a gust of air that threatened to knock me over before settling back down. Tia Teng raved about you and your calf. I wanted to see if something as weak as a human could truly be the herald. Tarsane tends to be too accepting of humans. I think it is a repressed desire. I arched an eyebrow, but I wasn't about to discuss Tarsane's issues. And all of this was to what? Test me? I expected you to run or cower. The last person was on the ground with his head covered pleading for us not to hurt him. She said it the same way I would say the trash hadn't been picked up. There was that one a few centuries ago. He at least attacked. This was Lava Dragon again. He'd collapsed the side of his hole into a shallow divot and was laying in it, enjoying it, I presumed. True, but the idiot used fire. Outside of the Quetzals, fire's annoying, not much more. Then he screamed and ran into a lava flow. Zmog paused. That was greatly entertaining. I had not realized humans could scream so loud. I shuddered at the imagery. That still doesn't tell me what you wanted. She sat up straight. You did me a great boon by finding my son. He's enraptured by the idea of working partnership with a mage, as opposed to the subservient one he allowed himself to be trapped in though I understand that was in part due to your calf talking you up. I narrowed my eyes, noting she never said Carolyn's name. I will tell you I was both concerned and impressed that you had so captivated his ideals, though he talked to you but a short while. That made me want to test what sort of person you were. This time she paused and looked around, a shake of her head as she looked back to me. Perhaps I went too far. You think? I said dryly, annoyed beyond all belief. Zmog snorted and dipped her head once. <laughs> you would have made an excellent dragon. You bowed to no one. Are you sure you would not rather have a dragon as a focus? They are much more impressive than a calf. Chapter 36 Section 95.26 the OMO, while a necessary functionary for the draft and managing mages, is not part of the United States government, and as such, shall have no input on policy or enforcement of policy that is not directly related to mages. Even there, they shall be required to work through the designated draft board chair. The sputtering that came from Carolyn made me laugh, and it broke the tension in the area, though I still wish she could have gone about this another way. All of that is fine, but why the huge snag for my work? Merlin, why didn't you just ping me? I could have met you somewhere. The dragon blinked at me, then glanced at Carolyn, then at me. It... it didn't occur to me. I was unaware you were pingable. That excuse sounded extremely weak. Carolyn snorted. You mean you wanted to make a big showy scene and remind people that Tia Teng wasn't the only dragon. Plus, if word got back to him, he would realize you could command the attention of Cory too. Maybe. Smog admitted, and I threw my hands up in the air. Really? I'm how you're keeping score and competitions among each other? From behind me came a familiar voice. Well, you have to admit... It is working beyond any expectation I had. Why would we stop? I stiffened. Slowly, I turned to see Tersane slithering up from behind a small hillock. She wore nothing but a smile, 
but her snakes bounced around, hissing in a manner that seemed excited. I heard answering hisses from the Quetzals and decided I wasn't going to ask. Because I'm not your play toy? I asked, though I really suspected I was. Shouldn't I be getting paid if I was going to be some reality show contestant? Tersing grinned, not maliciously, but in true amusement. Mine? No. Magic's? Very probably. She shifted her gaze to the black flame dragon. New look, Onyx? He flicked a wing, and more dirt cascaded off. It is more comfortable than one might think. Tersane shrugged, her breasts rising impressively. I snickered internally. Here, there weren't any human males or Joe to enjoy the show. Have you finished trying to intimidate the Herald? She asked, coiling up in the sand. Trying is correct. Your Herald has a sting, Zmog replied. If y'all are going to sit around and talk about me like I'm not here, I'll leave, I stated. There were so many other things I needed to do. Wait, I did also bring you here for a reason, Zmog said, settling into a very cat-like pose with her feet in front and tail wrapping around while she sat on her hind haunches. I glared at her. And that would be? And it was something you couldn't just tell me any other way? The dragons were now on my snark list. This entire day was going to be nothing but me dealing with the fallout from this, and I already was dreading what I would be dealing with when I got back. This was much more entertaining, Zmog admitted, and she had the same level of concern Caroline would in the same situation. None. I tossed an offering to air. Being able to use the branches of Joe and Sable's magic was so nice, and blew dirt in her face. You're right. That is much more fun. Smog growled and blinked her eyes, ignoring the chuckles of Onyx behind her. Point taken? She shook her head again, then sat up straighter. Her sighs made me swallow. Nerves and annoyance only got you so far when you had a bean in front of you that looked like it was the size of a two-bedroom house. Since my son was rediscovered, I made it a point to start paying attention to the mages in his sphere— I do not approve of most of them. I took that comment with a huge grain of salt, as I had no idea what a dragon may or may not approve of. The denizens were not human, and even contemplating their constantly changing morality gave me a headache. They want to control the availability of mages across the globe, with their country being the only one with an excess of mages. They believe it will give them a monopoly in various industries." This meshed with what I had been figuring out, but I still didn't have anything actionable. There wasn't much I could do, as most countries try to do that on a regular basis. To that end, they have programs running to eliminate mages in most countries. Yours, Russia, Australia. And they talk of a new event that will gut the United States and make them the premier country for mages in your world. A shiver ran down my spine at that. I don't suppose you have proof? Not that I knew what to do with that information if she did have proof. No, only overheard whisperings. And why would Smog, clan leader of dragons, care about the machinations of the human world? Tersane asked. I had to admit I was curious about the answer to that question as well. My son lives in that world. I would see him be happy and healthy there. I looked at her in silence and so did Tersane. I don't think either of us bought that answer. She huffed, and a trail of smoke trickled up out of her nostrils. And I dislike the idea of magic being so under one nation's control. Magic does not do well when her vessels are constrained so much. Atlantis is a warning to us all. Tersane flinched, and her arms dropped down to her sides. True. If that is what is coming... It is right you have warned the Herald. I should not have suspected you. Onyx snorted this time. <laughs> yes, you should have. Zmog is a devious egg layer, which is why I chose her all those seasons ago. Who wants a boring, predictable mate? I smiled as Zmog preened and flicked her tail at Onyx, whacking him on the nose at the same time. 
Corey, can you prevent this? Tersane asked. I bit back the urge to scream. Unless I have proof, no. And even then, this is another country we're talking about. I have no ability to do anything. Tersane glared at me, and I suppressed a flinch. Her face had approached the beauty that turned people to stone, and I couldn't help the fear. But I channeled it and glared back at her. I can't! Me rushing in and trying to kill the people behind this would just get me and then a lot of other people killed. And I don't know who is leading this. The Chinese plan for decades, centuries even. So does Japan. I can warn people, but they are going to ignore me without evidence. They are talking about an event, Smog interjected into our staring contest. That they want to set it up so that they will prove their supremacy, make their rivals look at fault, and guarantee their hold on mages. I chewed that over, but event could mean anything. Is there anything else you can tell me? Smog tilted her head one way, then the other, as if listening to multiple voices. They said they have virus samples? I froze. They said what? She gave me a look and continued. Well, they want to hold them until the treaty has been completed. That Japan will look guilty, not them. She shook her head. I don't know if this is important, or ruler's plot and scheme. I do. What are virus? My mind raced as I tried to figure out the ramifications of that. Why push for the treaty if they already had the virus? Virus is the tiny life forms that cause sickness on Earth. That was as simple as I could put it. I wasn't about to get into exactly what a virus was. Onyx's voice filled my mind. Much of what they said means little to us, but the way they said it, the hushed tones, the tiny meetings, even those that kill when spotted. We have watched humans for eons and know to ignore their squabbles about mating, but it sounded important with how furtive they were, how much they hide their conversations. How do you listen in? I wasn't 100% sure I wanted to know, but at this point, I was grasping at anything that might help make sense of this mess. We've started creating micro rips and we take turns. Now that we know where he is, we will not lose him. We mostly listen around Teotang. I will make sure he is safe there. While we are hard to kill, it is not impossible. Mages, if they're ruthless enough, can kill us easily. She nodded at me with an odd level of respect. I sighed. I don't know if that makes it better or worse. It means that anything you overhear could have nothing to do with this situation or everything. For all you know, they could have been talking about a video game or a movie. Zmog shrugged her wings. Truth? I scrubbed my face with my hands, glad I pretty much never wore makeup. I would have been running down my face by this point with the heat and my own stress. Thank you, I said finally. But next time, could you just ping me and say you want to talk? I almost begged, but I shot Tarsane the same pleading look. If I had thought dragons could blush, I might have thought Zmog was. But she rose up, stretching her wings wide. We will protect our own, and as always, we are magic servants. It was said with an aura of ritual. She stood and pushed off, clearing my height with one leap before her wings beat and she gained height stirring up dust. I pulled on air to keep it away from me. Don't mind her. We will let you know. Onyx stood, stretching. It is time to go hunt. I looked around the area. This is not your home? Onyx laughed. <laughs> no, simply a sunning area. The heat feels wonderful. Be well, Corey Munro. As if his words were a signal, all the dragons in the area launched themselves into the air and started beating their way through the sky, following Zmog. I watched them go, and then turned to Tersane. So, you are here, why? I doubt it had been to rescue me. I can't just check in on my favorite herald? She asked, not looking at me as she stretched, her snakes and arms reaching high into the sky. Aren't I the only herald? Which makes you my favorite, she replied with a backwards glance at me. 
Then, no, I don't believe you just happened by. My frustration bubbled close to the surface, but there was still only so much I'd snark the gorgon. Ah, shame. Let's just say a little birdie told me some creatures had gotten grabby-handed. The most interesting things happen when you get annoyed. I had nothing else to do, so why not show up? I sighed. <sighs> then, since my activity is ended, I think I shall return and deal with the fallout from my very public abduction. Oh, that should be interesting. Should I watch? Are you planning on doing anything fascinating to someone? Could you skin them alive? What? No, please don't. I paused. How would I even... I paused as at least one method to strip the skin off of someone jumped into my mind. Acids were so easy to create. Never mind. I don't want to know. And no, I'm positive it will be boring, lecturing, bureaucratic nonsense. Ah, shame. Well, please do remember to notify me, and I might pass it on to Salastra. She commented on a teasing note, still not looking at me. I groaned. Ugh, if that is all. I visualized where I needed to sidestep to, an area outside the lobby so I could walk back in. There is one thing I thought I would mention, Tursane said idly, turning to slither away. Oh? I paused, her voice too blithe. This gorgon never said anything that didn't have layers of meanings. Remember that magic does not like to be manipulated and the deaths of her children could have grave consequences. Between one slither and the next, she was gone. I stared after her, worried and perplexed. Carolian, do you know what that meant? He was silent for a long time, standing next to me, staring off where she had been. Specifically, no. But if the event that has been mentioned accumulates in the death of many mages, there may be a ripple effect. That would do what? I felt my temper fraying. That is the problem. With magic, you never can tell. Just great! You know, if you guys are trying to drive me insane, I think it's working. Carolyn flicked his tail at me. Whatever made you think we were sane to begin with... Chapter 37, Section 2.20.3 Misdemeanors will always have the penalty of shorn hair and nails cut to the quick. Jail time is deemed useless, and the penalty will always include community service and draft extension up to five years. If the mage has completed their draft, they may have their community service doubled. I stepped back into the hot, muggy air of D.C. and almost whimpered as the dust that had settled on me despite my best efforts instantly became mud sticking to my skin and my clothes. Alaska was sounding better and better. I looked around, and other than a few gouges on the terrace out front, there was no evidence a dragon had been there not too long ago. Checking my watch told me it had been two hours, which oddly seemed about right. Some of the interaction had taken longer than it seemed, and fighting always made time fly. No attacking the humans, I reminded Caroline as we headed to the lobby doors. But I won't argue if you growl and hiss and scare the socks off them. You ruin so much of my fun. He flicked his tail at me as I pulled open the doors. Yes, I know. I walked in, and sure enough... Lieutenant Striven was standing there with Pearl and adjunct Lorison. I suppressed a groan. Monroe, get over here. Striven snapped, and I set my jaw. I continued walking at my normal pace. Are you sure I can't bite him? I ignored Carolian. Hey, I said as I walked up to them, feeling disheveled, annoyed, and wondering if I would end up in Alaska before this was all over. What? happened. Striven glared at me as he raked his eyes up and down my form. I opened my mouth, then stopped. Center? Calm. Being snarky will get me nothing. I will be more than happy to tell you, but first I need a bottle or two of water. 
And are you really sure you want to have this conversation out here? I gestured to the lobby where people were already falling quiet to listen or stare at us. Strivent glared, but Daniel nodded. That would be wise. Mrs. Takashi, please get Merlin Monroe some water while the lieutenant and I escort her to the conference room on the second floor. I could see a mutinous expression in her eyes, but she nodded and spun around, heading away. Merlin Monroe? Lorison gestured, and I knew it wasn't a request, so I smiled and headed through security with him while Striven followed. I frowned, looking at my empty hand. Merlin blasted, I dropped my coffee cup there. I liked that cup. It soured my mood a bit more. Not that it needed any help. Right now, I wanted water and a shower. One brief elevator ride later, I was in a conference room with two men and Pearl glaring at me. I ignored them until I had one bottle of the icy cold water gone. It helped wash the dust out of my throat, though I would need to change clothes to be presentable. They all just stared at me, and I sighed. <sighs> what would you like to know? There were many, many days when I felt like running away. This was rising higher on my list of days. Who took you and why? Striven blurted. I would like to know if it was really a dragon. Lorison commented before I could respond. Yes, it was a dragon. Technically, it was the dragon of China's mother, and she... I fumbled for the right words. Wanted to talk to me and didn't think about a much more civilized way to do it. Besides, she enjoyed showing off. But it looked nothing like the dragon of China. Pearl protested. I shrugged. I wasn't going to get into an argument about dragon biology. If you want to know, I'll ask her to come talk to you about it. All three of them shook their heads, and I repressed a snort of amusement. What did you want to talk to you about? I'd like to point out the security clauses you signed said anyone, not just humans. You were not allowed to talk about many of the things you see here. Striven had his stern face on, and I had an image of him before Zmog begging for his life. I kept my face calm and did not laugh at that thought. I hadn't remembered most of the security clauses because 90% of what I had been involved in so far seemed to be common sense or stupid. Nothing anyone would want to know. I have no reason to believe I divulged anything that would be regarded as secure information. I replied slowly as I thought about the conversation. Then, if it was not to get State Department secrets, why would she kidnap you in such a public manner? Striven demanded. I took another sip of my water from the bottle I hadn't drained. She wanted to see the mage her son was so impressed with, the royal family treats him like a dumb animal, and Carolyn talked up our relationship a lot. All three of them shot glances at Carolyn, who sat in the chair next to me, licking his paws and then cleaning his face. He didn't even flick an ear their way. All of that because she's a helicopter mom? Pearl's voice squeaked a bit, and her face flushed. I somehow suspected she'd had a much more up-close encounter with Zmog than the others, more a mom whose child disappeared over a hundred years ago, and she just wanted to know who he was all excited about. I shrugged. If that was it, what took so long? Striven glared at me as if I was going to break and babble that I had given away state secrets, if I knew any. First, there was a dominance game, which I won. Then they talked about the things they overheard. What? That burst came out of three mouths, and I sighed. This wouldn't go down well. They're worried about the uproar Tiatang caused and have been eavesdropping on the royal family in China to make sure they are not planning on hurting Tiatang. They heard things that concerned them and wanted me to know, mainly that China wants to be the primary source of all mages and that they're planning something big. I weighed information about the virus, then shrugged. They also overheard stuff that makes it sound like China already has the virus and just want the treaty for publicity reasons. I expected some reactions, but not what I got. Pearl waved her hand. China has wanted to be the primary source for all mages for the last hundred years. They've done raids, seduction attempts, even pregnancy manipulation. 
We know something is working because we've seen drops in the birth rates of our mages. But everything is so random, we haven't figured out a way to stop it. There's a commission on it already. Lorison nodded. They are always planning something. It is their culture to try to take advantage where they can, but only if they can plausibly deny it or shift the blame to someone else. And as for them having the virus... He gave a little half-laugh. <laughs> I would be more surprised if they didn't. The treaty just gives everyone the legal right to use it and go public with what they have discovered. I could read between the lines and understood what he wasn't saying. The U.S. already had the virus too, though not all the research notes which in some ways were more important. You aren't worried? I asked, all too unsurprised by their reactions once I thought about it. Everything was games here in Washington. Games I had no desire to play. Lorison and Pearl looked at each other and shrugged. Unless they can tell us what an event or plan is, it isn't anything we haven't known for years. They are usually subtle and long-term, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. I blinked again. I'm worried. Striven ground out, and I looked at him, my eyes widening at how clenched his jaws were, what do you mean they've been eavesdropping on the royal family? How? When? Why? Are they doing it here too? Oh, it hadn't really occurred to me, but from the throbbing on the side of his head, I worried he might have an aneurysm. Why? I already told you. When? I shrugged. Whenever they think about it or are interested. Maybe when Tieting tells them something is going on. Other than that, I couldn't say. What are they planning on doing with the information? And you haven't said how they are doing this. Strippant didn't move his eyes away from me, and I was starting to wish Salastra would stick her head in again. That reminded me of what Tersane said, but I didn't think they would take that any more to heart. I think you need to understand the denizens, or at least their societies. They have societies? Lorison demanded, his attention back on me. Yeah, I said nodding my head, wondering if everyone was this manic all the time, or if I was just lucky. There are select beings that are part of the lords. I mean, I know of the chaos lords, so I assume there are spirit and order lords also. Then they have their leaders, Tursain the Gorgon, Salstra the Unicorn, and Bob. They didn't say anything, just kept staring at me. They don't live like us, more like animals, but with magic, and understanding that sometimes their prey is sentient. I groaned. Ugh, I don't know it, not really, but mostly it seems like a loose bunch of family groups that organize by species and realms. They don't have a government or cities the way we think of them, but they do have homes and places they consider theirs. So they are spies? I rolled my eyes at Strivent. Spies? No. I, I mean, yes, but no. They care about their families. As to how, well, they open tiny rips between there and here and listen. I've never done it, so I only heard them mention it. I shrugged. This is not good. I've never heard of someone being able to do this. But you know what this means? Dragons can listen in on sex talk? I hazarded a guess, wondering if he would have an attack. Ugh! He pushed away from the table in a violent motion that had Carolyn hissing, exposing all his teeth. Strivent didn't even seem to notice. Instead, he paced back and forth in the room. Civilians never get it. You blasting mages don't think. If someone has a familiar, they can listen in anywhere. There would be no place in the world safe from eavesdropping. We would have zero operational security. His voice got more strident as he moved back and forth, arms waving. Even Pearl and Lorson were scooting out of his way. What makes you think we care that much? I could tell from the vibration that Carolyn had spoken to more than just me, and the sudden stumble as Strivent came to a halt let me know at least one person had been included. He stared at Carolyn, so did Pearl and Lorison. I just shook my head and drained the remaining water bottle. I needed a shower. You're her familiar, Strivent protested, still looking around the room as if he thought someone else was there. 
Yes, and I care about her, all of my queens. Old men sitting in a meeting talking about things that will crumble to dust? No. If someone threatens my queen, I will kill them. Listening to words that are empty is not worthy of a hunter. Even the dragons only listen because they worry. If they thought their child or their clan was in danger, there would be no royal family. You are like a swarm of Chitarians, making webs and plans that no prey would ever fall into. Carolian jumped off the chair and put his head on my arm. They are not worth your time. This draft wastes what you could be. He spoke only for me, and I scratched his forehead. I agree, but duty is what I'm shackled by. He knew the consequences of me walking away, and I would never do that to Joe and Sable. So I suck it up. A decade was doable, right? The desire to give up the research bubbled hard, and I knew I needed to look it over again. Maybe there was a way out. Are we done? I need to go home and take a shower, I said, rising. They looked at me and nodded, but as I walked out the door, Strivent called out, We will be talking about how you are getting in without swiping your badge. I nodded and left, not sidestepping until I was outside of the building. Chapter 38 Section 2 Point thirty two point three. When needed, mages will be contracted to assist with police investigations. They are to remain available to the jurisdiction until the case is resolved, either via an innocent verdict, justifiable, or execution. Only under extenuating circumstances may they leave the jurisdiction, and even then they should remain available if needed for the court hearing. Any mage not obeying that rule may be brought up on charges and executed for civil disobedience if found guilty of avoiding their duties. I grabbed my stuff, walked out of the building, making sure I badged out, and sidestepped home as I turned a corner. An hour later, showered and dressed in comfortable clothes, I collapsed on the couch and reviewed everything that had happened. Joe and Sable got home after jealousy-inducing normal days at the office. While they listened to what happened to me, they didn't have any suggestions what to do with the information. I went to bed early and tossed and turned all night trying to figure out what I was missing. When I woke up, I was reminded I'd left one of my favorite mugs in that dry realm and had to go with another one. This one only held 20 ounces of coffee instead of 30. I packed extra coffee supplies. I sidestepped to the side of the building Carolian scoping it out first, then walked in. I nodded at the glaring Lieutenant Strivent, swiped myself in, and headed up to my cubicle. Pearl called out as I walked by. Come see me after you log in. She didn't sound mad, but who knew at this point? I set everything up and had my coffee gripped firmly in my hand as I walked into her office. Morning, I said trying to put some enthusiasm in my voice. I failed, but I did try. Pearl gave me a considering look. I took comfort that it wasn't loathing, more considering, and I sat down without waiting for her to offer. It is at that. She leaned back in her chair, looking at me. I read your file, and to be honest, I assumed you were a troublemaker, a prima donna, or even just spoiled. To my pleasure, you were none of those things. But few things I'd have you work on, you've done well and efficiently, even if you didn't bow to my pressure to give up information to the Japanese. I arched an eyebrow and took a sip of my coffee. At this rate, maybe I needed to add something stronger to my morning drink. Could I get over-caffeinated enough to not be frustrated with this job? But after having you here for two weeks... She paused and checked the calendar. It's only been two weeks... A sigh escaped her lips, and Pearl shook her head. <sighs> After having you here, she continued, I have realized much to my chagrin that the moniker of Koi Catastrophe is accurate. I started to protest, and she just held up her hand, 
giving me a quelling look. I fully understand that with everything that has happened, you have caused none of it. In fact, you tried to warn people it wouldn't work. You, were unfortunately, were correct. I cannot blame the dragon on you or even your familiar. Here she gave me a narrow-eyed look, but it seemed more resigned than exasperated or even angry. Nor the incident yesterday. Though knowing you were in the building would have saved us at least 20 minutes of stress wondering where you were. I felt my face heat, and I nodded. That won't happen again. She didn't respond to that, still just looking at me. Which leaves me with a problem, she said, looking at me. I tried to keep my face a mask and focused on my coffee. Drinking it, letting the sharp, bitter taste and the sweet following occupy my mind. It helped a little. One corner of Pearl's mouth quirked up. What exactly am I supposed to do with you? The last few days I've spent more time talking about you with others than I have all the people under me for the last year. I lifted one shoulder. What was I supposed to say? Here's the issue. You are mostly useless to me. And I'm annoyed at all the capital I spent getting you here when I can't use you. Her lips hardened for a minute, then relaxed. My fault. I'm too used to bulldozing people, and I figured it was just paper you'd hand over without protest. I kept my mouth shut, since I still didn't know what Japan might want so bad. Jorgaz's comments about the pocket reality made little sense, but I needed to review the research in depth to figure it out. And so far, I'd only skimmed over the information, not processed it. Until we can move you to a different area, I'm stuck with you. Can you suck it up and not make our lives any more difficult than they already are? Do I have a choice? I asked, my voice serious. Sure, you can make everyone here hate you by whining and throwing a fit. But if you can handle being here until the new year... We will work on getting you someplace where your skills are most suited. I tried to keep the relief off my face. This is not where my personality or my skill set belonged. Though it wasn't like the draft had a job search engine I could flip through and see what was available. I don't think acting like a spoiled brat would be wise of me. I can sit down and shut up until then. Getting somewhere that I could use my skills would make three months of drudgery worth it. Good. Now out. Since you can't help me, I need to figure out how to deal with all of this. I rose and headed toward the door. Mala Monroe? I looked back at her, waiting. If you hear anything actionable from your... friends, please let us know. The situation in China has a lot of us upset, and right now everyone is scrambling to see if they can find an ambassador to China with a familiar. The error in our ways has been made crystal clear to... Familiars are not fancy animals to be admired. They're your... She trailed off, frowning. Partner. Or friend. They call themselves our focus. And maybe they are. But they all have human-level intelligence. I stopped and gave her a long look. Just remember they are not human, and their interpretations don't always mesh well with human culture. Pearl tilted her head. Such as... I nodded at Carolyn, who had stuck his head in the door as I was about to leave Pearl's office. He saw no reason to get up as early as I did, but he wanted to know what Pearl talked to me about. He still thinks if I beat someone in a fight, he should get to eat them. Her eyes widened a bit, then narrowed. Ah, I see. Thank you. Please, have a quiet rest of the year, Merlin Monroe. I have enough work to do. I laughed as I left and went back to my cube. Pearl lived up to her promise, and I had no more meetings with diplomats about treaties or anything else. Instead, I had research projects, collating information, and being bored out of my skull. After the second week, Caroline didn't even bother to come in, preferring to go roam. Though, when he decided it was nap time, he sprawled out under my desk, where I'd put a large dog bed, and snored. Even if he said he didn't, he snored. It was cute. Most of the make work they gave me didn't take me long, and wasn't all that interesting, though the occasional research rabbit hole was. 
But what I needed to do was review the research James had done. The idea of being caught with it in the office ate at me, and working from home just wasn't done at the State Department. I can carry and guard. Caroline made the offer after the third week of me needing to go somewhere in the Appalachians and hike to burn off energy. I'd already made a note to travel to the Rockies and the Cascade Range, so we had some more challenging places to go. That it would still be light there when I got off was also a bonus. What do you mean? I threw myself into my computer chair, already wondering if screaming would alleviate my boredom. It is easy enough for me to carry. I can step there and here and bring it. If anyone tries to take it, I will take it back to where it is safe. There is great information in that data that I fear you must know. I stared at him, hope blossoming in my mind. Something to do. You would? That gives me something constructive to do, instead of this stuff. I waved my hand at the cubicle that even now remained barren, except for my briefcase and coffee cup. Personal items were annoying in a place where anyone could walk by and take them. You are my queen, he responded, avoiding the answer. I can also go to the storage grove and obtain items from there. He opened his paw, revealing the thumb that most never suspected. I pulled him into a hug and rubbed his ears just the way he liked. The next month flew by as I studied and learned and was almost happy if not for the feeling that I needed to do something, not just read about it. I could see so much in what James had discovered, and the need to ask more questions, to probe, burned. But I also remembered what Georgas said. I had no desire to treat any of my friends like specimens. They were too important for that. Something had started to gel in the back of my mind as I looked again at the research. Georgas was there at every step and assisted or lent his abilities to much of what James did. James had only been a regular Merlin, not a double. I paused at his ranking, frowning. Something Georgas had said to me filtered back. Caroline, do you know if James was a double Merlin? I asked mentally, as I was in the cubicle. While most people were treating me like a pariah, that didn't mean they weren't paying attention, though not enough to see exactly what I was taking notes on or reading. I never left the binder or notepad visible. If I had to go to the bathroom or get more coffee, I slept them under Carolyn's sleeping body. He made an excellent guard. He yawned as I looked at him. I have no reason to believe he was though he died way before my time, so I have no way to know. Ask Georgas. I looked at my notes again, still processing what I had almost put together. Georgas mentioned once that phoenixes were all realm creatures. What exactly did that mean? Out of the corner of my vision, I saw him curl and tuck his muzzle under his paws. He could be so darn cute I wanted to take another pic and post it to Sable and Joe. The problem with cute familiars, they beg to be immortalized in images. Cath are chaos, always have been. We resonate better with that realm, both our personalities and our magic. This does not mean other realms are barred to us, just that we prefer our own realms. He nibbled his shoulder hard for a minute, then settled back down. But there are some that resonate with all the realms, most of the apex beings, I guess. He hummed in my mind for a minute. Hmm, that isn't right, but I don't know how to categorize it. There are those who resonate with all the realms, what you might call a triple Merlin. We don't tend to designate that way. Maybe a full mage instead of the crippled version of humans. He sounded thoughtful, and I recognized a conversation derailment and interceded. So how many of these all-realm beings are there? I kept my head down, looking at the notebook. Anyone walking by had no reason to believe I was doing anything except reading and writing. That I know of? He sounded thoughtful again. Dragons, phoenix, sphinx, valkyries, and chimeras. I blinked at the list. How many are ever familiars? Only the dragons and phoenix. 
The other three find Earth boring and humans tasty. Well, Valkyrie don't eat humans. They just only care when they are dying. It is complicated. I recognized his I'm done talking tone, but I had one more question. Do all focuses help their mages? He flicked an ear at me. Of course, that is what we are, a focus of magic. But my computer beeped with an incoming call. I paused my talking to answer it, fumbling as always for my headset. Corey Monroe, I said, wondering who was calling. I didn't talk to anyone in the State Department, and everyone else had my personal number. Merlin, this is security. We have someone here saying they have a meeting with you. Shall we escort him to the Level 1 conference room? I looked at my calendar. It was empty, as I had thought. I don't have anything scheduled. Yes, ma'am. He said it was imperative he speaks with you. The guard sounded hesitant, and my alarm bells went off. Who is it? Hisahito Yamato. Chapter 39, Section 2.20.20 At no point should a mage be held liable for protecting themselves from harm. It is acknowledged they are living weapons and will be granted the right to protect themselves, even if death is the result for the attacker. I managed to not run down the stairs or give in to the desire to pull the fire alarm as I went down to meet him. Why in the world would he be here? And did he travel via mundane means, or could he sidestep? As far as I knew, I was the only mage who could do it with little effort. But that meant nothing. The more I learned, the more I realized how much we didn't talk about, because we didn't want the OMO or the draft to learn. Pearl had been on the phone, so I sent her a quick email letting her know before I headed out. Carolyn strolled alongside me. The elevator took forever, but I got it to myself as it slid down, delivering me to what was certain to be a stressful meeting. Maybe I need to take a meditation. At this rate, my blood pressure is going to be permanently high. He is waiting in here, Merlin Moreau, a guard said as I stepped out on the second floor. I learned the second floor held smaller conference rooms for ad hoc meetings, while the fourth held ones with teleconference abilities, as well as more seating. The guard led me to a room and opened the door, ushering me in. Lady Luck snapped up around me while I prepped to pull up an electrical shield, even if it screwed up my phone. Carolyn darted in first. I stepped through, all my attention on scanning the room for danger. It was a normal, boring conference room, a square table with four chairs, a whiteboard, and one man standing in the corner looking out the window to the lobby. He turned to look at me as I stepped through, and I recognized Hisahito. He wore a severe suit in dark gray, with his hair bound in braids pulled away from his face. There was no color in anything he wore. He was all shades of gray and black. But his eyes held something that I didn't expect. All the various ways to say hello flitted through my mind, and none of them seemed appropriate. I wasn't actually happy to see him, and I had no idea if this was a meeting of allies, enemies, or business-related. Hisihiro, this is unexpected. I let the door close as I stepped all the way in. I suppose it would be. He replied, his eyes flicking once to Carolyn, then staying on me. I swear I'm not here to harm you. The words surprised me, though they did not reassure me. That's good. People yell at me when I damage buildings. An emotion flickered across his face, and he nodded his head, hiding his face for a moment. Yes, that tends to annoy those tasked with maintaining it. He lifted his head. Please, sit. I would like to talk to you. I ran my hand over Carolyn's head as I walked over to a chair. After making sure I had a clear shot at the door and had the apartment location clear in my mind, I sat. Sidestepping there would take me less than a second if I was desperate enough. Hisahito sat down at the opposite end of the table. He folded his hands and looked at me. You have created much consternation among the diplomats for Japan. I almost protested it wasn't my idea, but managed to keep my mouth shut. Never take blame that isn't assigned. 
And how would that be? Carolyn had jumped up in one of the other chairs, pinning Hisahito between us. The man didn't look happy, but he didn't move. The consternation of our representatives was extreme. They are not supposed to be in the same room as you. Yet Talib would have created unacceptable loss of face. It was an unfair position to put those who have little agency for their actions. I fought to keep my face smooth, though I wanted to wince. My current life was enough like theirs that my sympathy was high. I tried to warn my superiors that Japan would have issues with me. Unfortunately, I have little agency in the situation either. He frowned, his eyes tracing the symbols on my temple. But you are Merlin, a double, more powerful than any we know. The words seemed dragged out of him. Why do they waste you with this? I gave him a cold smile. They wanted my inheritance to influence you? As badly as you wanted my inheritance. He tilted his head to one side. A valid, if misguided, effort on her part. If you didn't crumple with people trying to kill you, why did they think you would fold because they put job pressure on you? Laughter burst out of me, and I couldn't stop it. Hisahito quirked an eyebrow at me as I tried to get hold of my laughter. I lifted a hand in mute apology. I was, I was not laughing at you, more at the accuracy of your statement. But then... When have politicians ever been logical? <laughs> he nodded his head in acknowledgement of my comment. I do forget how much easier it is sometimes with one ruler, not a gaggle of people that all want to go in different directions. I'm not sure I would be able to handle it. He glanced out the window, the lobby and all its activity displayed like a miniature world outside of ours. You all seem so chaotic in your actions. I shrugged, watching him. Why was he here, acting all nice? It made no sense. The emperor does not know I am here, he said into the silence that had fallen between us. I jerked a bit at that. He doesn't? Then why would you come? Why did you come? I might have been a bit exasperated at that point. This was Esmir's game, not mine. I knew James. We were old friends. He grew up in Okinawa, military brat. Okinawa was the only base in Japan, placed there as part of the war. Sable's dad had been stationed there too. The parallel was interesting, but it didn't actually mean anything. Hisahito didn't look at me as he spoke, and I tried to figure out why he was here, and even more why he was telling me this stuff. We talked and dreamed as kids, even more as teenagers. Then we emerged and our discussions became more focused and directed. But still, we remained friends, though his familiar disliked me from the day he found it. There was bitterness to his words, and I felt a flicker of sympathy. The room fell silent, and I waited to see what else he would say, and I played with the idea of calling for Georgas. A lot of the research we both did, but his familiar meant he had more power and access than I ever could, and he was done with his service in a scant decade. My oath as the Mayutsushi is in place until I can no longer fulfill the duties of my office. At no point had he looked at me, and I wondered what he was looking at. Memories? Dreams? Why was he here? I am not a good man, he said, his voice hard. He jerked his head up to stare at me. His eyes resembled blank screens reflecting my own expression back at me. If I thought you did not already have a will set up, and that killing you would get me what I want, what my country needs, I would try to kill you. That is not in the book about making friends and influencing people. I muttered. My shield waited for me to call on it, the offering easy, and I could always step anywhere though I obviously needed to practice rolling to another place as opposed to standing up to step. A huff of amusement slipped past his lips. <laughs> I suppose not, but I would rather have you as an honest enemy than a false friend. He shook his head, his long hair moving like a snake's body in the reflection from the windows. 
I'd rather be no one's enemy if I had a choice. Mayutsushi, why are you here? And while I am curious about yours and Jorgaz's issue, I don't know how it affects me. His eyes had not left mine, though I kept glancing away, uncomfortable with his flat stare. I need that research. It is everything we need. I am authorized to offer you the research on Naoso and revoke your abomination status. He didn't blurt the words. He said them calmly and logically, and alarm bells went off. Why do you need the research? And if the emperor doesn't know you are here, who authorizes you? I asked, then shot a question to Carolyn. Can you ask your guest to come here? I don't understand what is going on. Done, he replied back. I watched as Hisahito studied his clasped hands. The relief to have his eyes off of me was palpable, but I still wanted to know the answer to my question. Mr. Yamato? The Empress. I sucked in a sharp breath at that. From everything I read, she almost never interfered in matters of state, preferring to stay in the background and manage her handmaids, the female mages in Japan. Why? He looked up at me, his face blank, so I clarified. Why is she sending you here and not letting the emperor keep control? Ah, Tomohito has his pride. Akiko bends like a willow. She sees the need and can let herself bend, but she sends me as the sacrifice. He didn't sound upset, just stating the way his world was. Before I could figure out how to respond to that, though I did register how close he was to both of them to call them by name, there was a flash of light to my left. I turned to see the form of Georgaz flapping in the air, then settling on the back of the only empty chair. You, hissed Hisahiro, and I marveled again at his skill in English that he could make the words sound like something filthy. Might in the feathers you are. Georgaz snapped back, and I groaned. Both of you are too damn old to be acting like kids. What's your problem? Your best friend died, and you're his familiar. Why aren't you supporting each other rather than fighting? I paused and turned to Carolyn. Just so you know, if I drop dead, get killed, or whatever, I expect you to stay by Joe and Sable's side, supporting them and letting them support you. None of the spitefulness back and forth. I was dead serious. The idea of Joe and Sable developing a relationship like this with Carolyn almost physically hurt. The bird and the royal magician just looked at me with shocked expressions. A bird looking shocked was rather amusing. What? If you're going to act like spoiled kids, I'm going to treat you like spoiled kids. I crossed my arms and glared at them. He studied it, Hisahito protested, then sat back and bowed his head. It is unseemly to fight with an animal, and immaterial to this conversation. We need the research. We will offer much. Jorgas had all his feathers fluffed out. He is a mite in human clothing and exists only to drain the blood from those who are foolish enough to host him. Trust him not and give him nothing. You can't afford the price. Until that moment, I hadn't realized birds could hiss and do it mentally. I looked at both of them, blinking, then pushed my chair back up. Without another word, I walked out, Carolyn a step behind me. Chapter 40, Section 2.20.16 Familiars that remain after a mage has died are to be treated as an endangered animal and only disposed of in extreme cases. At no point should the familiar be approached and apprehended. If they pose a danger, they will be eliminated immediately and then given full rights if possible. The door hadn't even closed behind me as I headed to the elevators before I heard mingled cries of wait and stop burst out. I didn't. I went and pushed the button down. A walk in the fresh air, muggy and polluted it might be, sounded better than sitting in there. The click of the door being pulled open sounded behind me. Mother Monroe, please, we do need to talk. And I need people to quit being mysterious or childish. Am I going to get my needs filled? 
I turned around as I spoke and waited. Yes, please come back. Georga sounded resigned and maybe a bit sheepish. I could see a splash of color beyond the door that Hisahito held open. Are both of you willing to act like adults and explain what I, a lowly flunky in this place, can do to get you to go away? My tone was dark because I was just annoyed. Again, Hisahito replied. I searched his face, but found only resignation and acceptance. With a sigh, I nodded and walked back into the room. We all resumed our seats, and I stared at Georgas. I've read through almost everything, and unless I'm missing something, the aspects you were worried about the most are not an issue. Even if I gave Japan the information to create another pocket realm, it would be very difficult for them to create one, and I believe you could easily derail that. How? Georgas demanded, even as Hisahito spoke. A pocket realm? Where would we want the pocket room? He held a confused look, and I stared at Georgas, who avoided my gaze by preening. A pocket room could be established by Merlin, and then it could be mined or exploited, then closed and done again and again, until in that area all magic had been drained. I watched Georgas as I spoke, snickering as his feathers puffed. That should not happen. It would damage much. He sounded aggravated and worried, so I quit being a jerk. Okay, I'm not sure how, but here's the catch. It only works if the mage has a familiar, and that familiar is an all-realms familiar, which, unless there are some I don't know about, means the Dragon of China or the Phoenix of Paris here on Earth, or if a realm denizen creates it for them, like Hamadia. The bird froze mid-preen, then lifted his head to look at me. Oh. Yes, oh. Again, unless I'm missing something, if you tell the focuses not to, and they don't assist, there's no way for any mage to form a pocket like that, or the permanent portal. Georges brightened, and I mean literally. His feathers became brighter, and barely visible licks of flame flickered around him. I had not considered that. Yes, I must talk to Tiatang and Flora. There are no others, but I can watch and see. With that comment, he vanished in a wash of flame. I groaned, shaking my head. I will never understand how most of these denizens think, I muttered, mostly to myself. I do not blame you. I never understood why he disliked me so. I met him for the first time as a chick. James had opened a small portal testing something and an egg tumbled into his hand quivering and rocking. Hisahito held a soft look on his face. I met Georgas about two months later. I admit I might have been rude. Fletching birds are not exactly elegant. I wanted to say what Georgas had said about Hisahiro. Social conventions urged me to explain, soothe feelings. Instead, I changed the subject. As you can see, what you want is not available to you or any of your mages. Can the hostilities cease? He blinked at me. A frown creased his smooth brow. For the first time, I realized he had to be in his 80s. Yet there was only a hint of gray at the temple to provide any clues as to his age. Neither I nor Japan have ever cared about creating a portal realm. At least not until now. If that isn't what you wanted, why in the world were you trying to kill me? I didn't even bother to hide my frustration. Those six months of fear. Watching where I was, worrying about Joe... Joe's blood on my hands, and my desire to be polite snapped. I had to kill a man who tried to kill me. He put a bullet through my best friend. I almost lost her. Then those two idiots attacked me in a building? What by Merlin's blood was your problem? Hisahito stiffened, his posture becoming more rigid. You were a threat. You had information my country needed. Information James had promised would be mine and the solution inherent in that research justified the cost. How do you justify trying to kill someone? I didn't shriek the words, but my anger was pulling on my magic, and I could see how easy it would be to reach out with fire and do something. Something horrible. That made me tamp down my emotions. If trying to kill someone was beyond the pale, 
I was pretty sure setting them on fire was just as bad, especially when they weren't trying to kill me. Because my country will die if I don't find what he promised me, he hissed, eyes glaring into mine. I don't care about the majority of what he discovered. He had so much free time, it didn't matter. You Americans aren't still trying to recover from the destruction of two cities in over half our mages. I pulled back as if slapped, my anger deflated. What? No, they don't tell you about that, do they? They just say two rogue mages detonated bombs on my country and people were unfortunately lost. No. Your history washes everything clean, and this is simply a horrible accident. He leaned forward, rage making his eyes sparkle. Those were our two major training centers for our mages. Being at war, now you took out over 70% of our mages in those two accidents. Most of them were young and barely starting families. The sneer on that word made me want to weep. We lost a full generation of mages, at least two more, since then, because of those actions, Japan is barely competing in this world where the power of your mages determines your political capital on the world stage. I would kill more than one girl to keep my country safe. If he had started breathing fire, it would not have surprised me. I sat and marshaled my thoughts. The war had happened right about the time he would have been born, so he hadn't been affected but obviously it was burned deeper into the psyche than I knew. Not that I knew much about it besides what the history books said. Both mages had died in that teleport incident, but his passion made me think maybe it hadn't been an accident. Mind your manners, mage. My queen was not even born, nor were her parents. When this occurred, she bears no responsibility for the actions done prior to her birth. Carolyn hissed the words, and they helped anchor me. I do not deny things were done between our countries, I said. But Japan was not blameless. POW camps that used the prisoners as subjects to test mage abilities, to twist and find new ways to fight, to kill. Many of those who came out of those camps lived short lives, and we won't speak of what your ally Germany did. I kept my voice flat. The war had cost so many lives. Hitler's pogrom had killed mages, Jews, homosexuals, anyone that didn't meet his ideals. He felt all Germans should be archmages or higher, and feared hedge mages polluting the blood. They were rounded up and treated the same as the other undesirable groups. I'd like to think we've progressed past that. He bowed his head, his breathing evening out. It changes nothing. I only regret that I did not succeed in my attempt, but not out of any animosity toward you personally. Only what you represent. You block that which could save us. He ground out the last part, but then he closed his eyes, hands flattened on the table. If it isn't what Jorgas was worried about, what do you want? I asked, exasperated and confused. The amount of passion surprised me. No greed just desperation, and that made me very uncomfortable. I don't know! His English slipped, and the words came out heavily accented. His hands went white as they pressed against the table. In jerky motions, he stood up and went to the corner of the room so there was no table between us. He knelt on the floor in that same jerky movement. It almost felt like someone was controlling him like a puppet. The promise he made to the empress... What had she made him promise? Kneeling, he then bowed all the way down until his head touched the floor. I watched. This was wrong. I shouldn't be here. I was the wrong person for him to be talking to. This man, enemy though he was, should not be bowing to me. I started to speak, but Carolyn stopped me. No, let him continue. I clamped my lips shut and waited. Hisahito lifted his head and looked at me. I beg you, with the offering of my life, grant unto me that which James left for me, the salvation of my country. He remained kneeling and waited for my answer. What the fuck? It took me a second to get control of my reaction, 
and I glared at Carolyn, hoping he had an answer. I do not know, but this is deadly serious. He's willing to die to get what he's speaking about. Carolyn seemed oddly pleased, and I didn't have time to deal with his smugness. Hisehiro, I managed, then sighed. I am royally tired of being a string pulled between various entities, but I promise you, I do not know what James left that would help you. It's not that I won't trade it, it's that I don't know what it is. He seemed to shrink. Truly, there were no notes left to send anything to me. I haven't gone through everything, but I will continue to look. I will not promise to give it to you, but I will tell you if I find it. It's the best I can do. I regretted the words the second they were out of my mouth, but I couldn't change them. That is more than I expected, but I will pay with my life for the research. He had regained his normal fluidity as he stood back up, but he now looked old, where not minutes before I had regarded him as ageless. He set a card down on the table. Here is how you may contact me. He flicked a glance toward Carolyn. Via mundane means, that is. I watched him, then nodded slowly. I will look, I promise. Though I still think if you had just told me this in the first place, I probably would have just given it to you. He turned his head to the side, as if in pain. I judged you by my own reactions. I would never have allowed such treasures out of my life. You are well within your rights to kill me right now, and none would blame you. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'd be charged for murder, and I'd blame me. Revenge doesn't justify murder. The idea made me gag slightly. Killing someone with adrenaline rushing, expecting to die at any moment, I could understand. The desire to save myself, save Joe, let me do a lot of things. But standing here now, to just kill him? No, I wasn't that person. I forget, and Japan you would not be held accountable. I must leave. I have other assignments while I am here. He turned and headed toward the door. He had shrunk somehow. Walking past me, he seemed smaller and older than when I first saw him. By all rights, I should hate him, want him to die. But mostly, I just wanted to cry for him and for the country he would sacrifice everything for. The door shut behind him, and Caroline looked as upset as I felt. Well, he is scared and feels deeply. I do not know the answer, my queen, but he serves and would die for his belief. I nodded slowly and headed back to my cube, not sure of anything. Chapter 41 Section 95.4 All mages are required to be registered with the OMO, any mage found that has not been registered past the age of 27 is deemed rogue. All rogues will be offered a one-time opportunity to serve in a double draft. Refusal will be treated as a terroristic act and acted on appropriately. Early November arrived. Halloween had been a blast. And about lunchtime, the atmosphere in the office became electric with excitement. I'd spent the time looking through everything James had left me, all the notes, and there wasn't anything. I had no idea what Hisahito wanted, or thought would save his country. I had gone through all the paperwork left for me in the bank boxes, and none of them had anything about stuff to give to Japan. I still didn't know how I felt, but his emotions had been real, and while neither I nor anyone I knew had anything to do with the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I couldn't help but feel a touch of guilt and wondered if I cared about my country as much as he did his. The only places left to look were all the boxes that James had left in Hamadia's Grove. I planned on going through those over Christmas. I was still a non-person in the department, and to be honest, I worked harder on making sure I knew everything James had researched than I did any actual work. My boredom levels were epic, and I was about to just quit showing up. 
Why bother? The muffled whoops, something I never heard in the office before, had me standing up and peering over my cubicle walls. Striding toward me with a grin on his face was Scott Yang. I had to look multiple times as I'd never seen him smile before, and it changed his entire face. Did something happen? I really hoped it was something minor, not like aliens showing up or Atlantis reappearing. Maybe Pearl had won the lottery? The treaty was signed and ratified. It's already filed with records and we can let other departments know to start working toward implementing the changes. This will look excellent on my resume. The smile still looked odd on his face, but I didn't tell him that. Excellent. And it was excellent. It meant maybe they could get me out of here, as my primary reason for being here was now gone. Now I could be reassigned somewhere that I could actually do something. Yes, there will be a party hosted by China to bring in the American New Year. It is a great treaty. I just nodded, still weirded out at his expression. Relief washed through me as he headed to Pearl's office, and I sank back down into my chair. Another two hours and I could go home. Malimamro, I have an assignment for you. I heard Pearl speak from the entrance to my cubicle. I saved the document I was working on, a simple breakdown of treaties by country and number, turning to face her. And that would be? Pearl glared at me in exasperation. Check your email. There's a list of all the criteria of who China wants to invite to celebrate the signing of the treaty. I need you to get the initial list and verify with the OMO the locations and status. The State Department will provide stipends for travel up to a certain amount. There's a plus one built into the funds for spouses and whatnot. Work with the Public Relations Office for the location and invitations. Your job is to verify the maid status of each invitee. You can access the Office of Magical Oversight website and obtain more information since your FBI clearance was never revoked. This will make it much faster for us rather than requesting it from the OMO and waiting for them to provide the information. I didn't have a reason to refuse the assignment. To be honest, I was bored to tears. The email glared at me, and I tried to convince myself this would be fun. I pulled out the requests, frowning a bit at the list of names, then logged into the OMO website. After cleaning up the data, which took me a good hour, I uploaded the list and waited for the OMO to kick it back. Twenty minutes later, I had another list from the OMO, and I bounced that against my cleaned-up spreadsheet. Most people didn't realize it, but half of being a scientist was being able to look at data and manipulate it. I was very good with spreadsheets. It was a list of people, about half of whom were registered in the OMO. The others I started to look up. The State Department had some very nice search databases, and many of the people were ambassadors and other high-up people in embassies or otherwise. I got the list from the OMO, sorted in alphabetical order, and started to list out the addresses that people would need to send to. I froze as I realized this wasn't just drafted mages, and I knew some of them. Joe's name was there, as was Sable's. Chills rippled down my back, and I started to pay attention to the data and what it said. Every mage on the list was an archmage or Merlin, and by my count, it included most well-known Merlins in the United States. I kept looking and frowned when I saw Shay, Indira, and Stephen included on the list. I got a bad feeling when I saw Hisahito was to be invited, as well as some of the representatives in the UN. Trying not to freak out, I went and pulled out the information on previous parties, and I didn't know if I felt better or not. There seemed to always be a high percentage of mages. I kept digging, but it looked like Merlin's got invites to most parties. That I wanted to check on, as I knew I'd never gotten one. I grabbed my phone and texted Indira. She and Stephen were still dating and didn't seem in a hurry to make it formal, though they had moved in together. They lived near Quantico, as Stephen still worked for the FBI, and Indira did her own research and took temporary jobs that interested her. We still got together every month or so, and I'd just seen them at our joining. If anyone would know, they would. Do you two ever get invites from the State Department or government for parties and stuff? I typed, then paused. And hi, my job sucks. A laughing emoji appeared, then words. 
that exciting, is it? And in answer to your question, yes, about three, four times a year. Most of the time we decline, but most Merlins get asked occasionally. It is a mixture of showing off prized thoroughbreds and pandering. I looked at this for a long moment. Then I shouldn't worry about a party where well over half the guests are Merlins? Why worry about a party at all? And no, some of those still under the draft may be required to come, but the rest of us usually decline. A long pause, then a curious emoji. What is going on to make you worry at all? Dinner this weekend? I responded instead, and went back to the list. The idea of trying to text all the conflicting emotions and thoughts in my mind sounded impossible. She agreed, and we made plans to go to dinner and talk about the stuff going on, something I really hadn't told them about so far. I paused, frowning when Bridget O'Keefe's name popped up on the list. She wasn't a mage. Tersane had seen to that. So why was she on the list? I logged back into the OMO website and pulled up Bridget. Oddly, it had the phrase, under review, possible deceased, on the top of the record, something I'd never seen before. Deceased? Surely she wasn't dead. A flicker of panic raced through me. What had Charles said her mother did? I racked my brain and then gave up and shot Charles a text. He responded back a minute later with her job. Being on your own computer with a chat history helped immensely. She worked for the State Department. It only took me two minutes to find her internal phone number. The list and the pending invite gave me a reason to call her, and I did want to know how Bridget was doing. I stared at her number, then back at the lists. Did that under-review show up in the report? Checking to see if any other mages had under-review flags ate up another ten minutes. Then I gave in. I needed to know things. It was my weak spot. Besides, if Bridget had died, I was going to fall apart. I'd done everything I could to make sure she didn't die. Headset on, I dialed the number. Margaret O'Keefe, may I help you? The vaguely familiar voice filled my ears, and I couldn't help a furtive glance around, as if I was doing something illicit. I really need to quit feeling like a kid with her hand in the cookie jar. Miss O'Keefe, this is Corey Monroe. I, um, met you at the draft thing? Bridget having her magic pulled away? I was pretty sure she'd remember me, but that didn't mean a strange voice would click for her immediately. Miss Monroe! I could hear the powerful emotions in that voice, and I wanted to blush. I am so glad to hear from you. Is your draft here? The number is local. Yes, I'm in the State Department. I took a breath. Is Bridget okay? I mean, nothing happened to her afterwards, did it? I didn't know if I wanted to know the answer, except that I needed to know the answer. Bridget? She's fine. Actually, better than fine. No more magic. They tested her multiple times and have one scheduled every six months. But it was like she never had any magic. Even the tattoos seem like they were never there when you look at her skin. I don't know that I'll ever be able to thank you enough. I sagged in relief. I'm glad. I was worried as the OMO has her as deceased. Margaret snorted. <laughs> yes, they talked to me about it. They don't have any other status they can use, and they refused to remove the record. So they marked her as dead. I don't care, as she isn't someone truly in the workforce, even if she does have a job. But I heard a rumor. She hesitated as if unsure she should say it. That this happened to lots of people everywhere? I asked my own amusement leaking through. Yes. Did it? From what I've been told, yes. The OMO has mentioned they want to talk to me, but they haven't followed up yet. And I wasn't going to remind them. Then you helped many more people than just me. I've been dreading the draft since she emerged. Stupid loss. She spat, but I could hear the grief and sorrow behind her words at the same time. Yeah, I murmured, but didn't comment, as I'd also seen the damage Bridget could have done with her anger. I did have another question for you, though, if you have a minute. Marla Monroe, you can ask just about anything of me, and I tried to give it to you. <laughs> she laughed, the sound making me smile. 
It's a good thing I don't really have access to anything super secret. You'd be able to get it out of me. I snickered. I don't really think I'm spy material. I lose my temper too easily. Clearing my throat, I refocused on the list and my confusion. <clears throat> I'm working on a list for a party to celebrate the signing of a treaty. Oh, they saddled you with getting the guest lists and addresses for the biological treaty between the U.S., Japan, and China? I blinked, surprised. Yes, how did you know? She laughed again. <laughs> I deal with a lot of the parties if they are multinational, and this party has a lot of people excited. There hasn't been a big party this year. It has all the people that want to see and be seen hoping for an invitation. Anything this big will get a lot of attention. Margaret paused for a minute. Ah, Bridget was on the list because she is a single female archmage. That makes sense. I think you can safely remove her from the list. She sounded sad and amused at the same time. While I do not doubt she would love the chance to dress up and go to a fancy party, I suspect others would not be as happy. I sighed. <sighs> no, probably not. You mind if I call if I have any other questions? Anything you need, Merlin Monroe. Ugh, Corey, please. There were some people I had no desire or need to intimidate. Chapter 42, Section 95.18 The OMO will provide addresses and other information for mages under the draft. The government will update the OMO should any information be found to be inaccurate. What do you mean you don't want us to go? Joe's voice managed to be calm and curious, but from the set of her jaw I knew she was pissed. Because something is going to go wrong. Not just my crazy luck, but something else. I hated that I sounded like I was pleading. Corey, explain, Joe said, her voice icy cold. I laid it out. Most of it she already knew, but I added the last bit about how the party would be the perfect opportunity. So you don't know for sure that something will happen? Sable had stayed silent watching us argue since I'd asked them to not go when they received the invitations in the mail. I not had any control once I validated the list, and removing their names, or Indira and Stevens, would have been too obvious. So you only think, not have any proof? Sable's calm, reasonable voice was the death knell for any chance I had of getting them to not go. My shoulders sagged, and I shook my head. No. Technically, security's high and they know this is going down and the threat's made, but it is all just talk. I have to be there, and then maybe after that I can get another position and go do something. My frustration leaked out at that. I was so damn bored, and nothing had clicked with the research James had done. I still didn't know what Japan might want. What did a country that wanted to be left alone need? Then, if you think we should let you go and not be there with you, you need to have your brains checked. Sable pushed herself off the wall and draped her arms around me from the back, dropping a kiss on my head. We love you, and that means being there to help and protect, just like you try to do for us. She overrode my protest. Hush! That is why Joe is so mad. We will always be there for you, because we know you will always be there for us. Now, we have other important stuff to discuss. She dropped one more kiss on my head, and I sighed as she pulled away. Joe was still glowering at me, but had lost the stiffness in her body. And what is that? I asked, trying to ignore Carly and laughing in my mind. Shopping, of course. We all need dresses fit for a New Year's Eve party. The smiles on their faces made me groan. Uh, fine. I've got dinner with Indira and Stephen this weekend, so next... I gave in to the inevitable. I knew they would never let me just wear something simple. Ooh, yes. Ask Indira if she would like to come with us. She knows the best places. I gave Sable a doubtful look. You know she is out in Virginia near Quantico, right? So, sidestep her here. Sable gave me a look, and I nodded. 
fine, though I don't think they really realized how easy sidestepping is for me. Jo rolled her eyes and got up, her anger fading. No, they are well aware of it. They just know how to keep their mouths shut. But I'm still annoyed with you. I'm almost tempted to get Sable and me dates just to prove how annoyed I am. Ooh, Charles could come as our plus one. Sable blurted, a wide smile on her face. I dropped my head in my hands and groaned. Mm, I apologize. I should have known better. And I trailed off. Yes, he's on the list, but the secondary invitees depend on acceptance. This time I paused, and with an evil grin, Joe, you should ask Shay. I bet he'd show up if you did. The two of them exchanged glances, wide smiles crossing their faces. Deal. I'll twist Shay's arm to come, and you'll have six mages at your back, and no are on your side. When will I learn to keep my mouth shut, and why do you think Shay will come? Joe shrugged. He's always been kind of nice, and if I present it as a prank, I bet he'll come, if nothing else to see what trouble you attract. I narrowed my eyes at her, wanting to refute that, but I knew deep down in my bones that would happen. You know, I am surprised they did not specifically ask you to invite other denizens, Carolyn said mildly. He'd quit laughing and was stretched out on the floor, looking like he was an inch away from melting into it. Why? I wasn't really the one that was supposed to do that, and the list came from the Chinese. I said the last part, thinking slowly. They had a few sections about criteria, but us, Joe, Indira, Sable, Stephen, were all specifically listed. The others were every Merlin and Archmage that had made a name for themselves. Nah, I can't be that. There were also ambassadors, political people, directors. It's a big list. I think the list is approaching a thousand people, and of that, at least half of them are mages. Ah, oh well, though I think we should do dinner and invite others over. I gave him a long look. Are you saying Esmir and others want to come over for dinner? I do not believe I said that, he replied primly, though it would be nice to have civilized conversation. The three of us snickered and looked at the calendar. What about Thanksgiving? Asked Sable. Would Amadia be willing to let us have dinner in her grove? Perfect weather. We can bring food from the kitchen. Everyone can come, and Dad and your family can come. Joe? We can even invite Indira and Staven and Charles and Archina. I thought about that. That would be fun. I think I can open a door to Amadia's grove anywhere if she lets me, though it won't last long, and we can just walk in. Do we include Marco and Paolo's family? Joe looked at Carolyn, whose tail lashed for a moment, then settled. Yes, Banyar loves children. I would invite Tiatang. I flinched a bit. Fine, but just him. I'm not sure I could take Zmog, too, or Onyx, much less feed them. I was still annoyed at her. Oh, you are starting to get into the game. That will be a wonderful amount of subtle insult. Invite her son, and not her. Esmir would be proud of you. Wait, that wasn't what... I trailed off as the three of them started planning food, and I just shook my head, staying out of the way. Saturday, I stepped out to my work step spot in D.C. and hailed the cab. Indira and Stephen lived in Montclair, but we had agreed to meet at a restaurant near D.C. They thought I was renting an apartment in the area, and they knew I avoided driving, if at all possible. I could drive... I still just worried about things going wonky, and it was easier to take public transportation. Carolyn had decided to skip dinner in favor of going to talk to his mother, and probably Tia Tang. I got the feeling those two had struck up a friendship. I worried that I was stifling him from having his own life. I stepped into the restaurant and spotted Indira and Stephen near one of the windows. The hostess escorted me over, and they rose as I approached. Corey... You look exhausted. And Dear gave me a tight hug, inspecting me closely. Before I could say anything, Stephen had pulled me into a hug as well. I agree. What's going on that a cushy job in the State Department has you so exhausted? If you had told me five years ago the jerk FBI agent would become like a big brother, I would have called you an idiot. But it was true, and I'd learned he'd be there if I needed him. I waited until the waiter had taken our order, 
then pulled on air from Sable to create an auditory shield for the discussion. Then I told them everything. The draft camp, Bridget, Tursane, the weird job, the pressure on me for my inheritance, and Tietang and Smog. I paused in the middle when they brought out our meals. This restaurant specialized in mage cooking. The chef, I assumed Sue and not the head chef, brought our food to the table. His mage tattoo was clearly displayed, but I suspected he had a wealth of hair up under his white chef hat. And who had the broiled salmon salad? Indira raised her hand. The chef, a man in his early thirties, set a bowl of salad with cranberries, nuts, and goat cheese liberally sprinkled on it before her. He then brought out a portion of salmon. Seasoning request. He waved his hand at the array of salts and spices on the tray. Mmm, lemon, mustard, and black salt, please, Andira said, after pondering her options for a moment. He nodded, seasoned the salmon, and then looked at it. It sizzled and bubbled sitting there on the plate. I couldn't help but grin. I'd have to tell Joe about this trick. She used fire to warm up coffee occasionally, but this was new. And you, miss? I had ordered sea bass thinking to take the extra home for Carolyn. With him in mind, I chose my seasonings. Sea salt, lemon, and red peppers. He smiled at me and set it up. Then it started to bubble as he deftly put the salmon on Indira's salad. As for your filet, sir, what temperature and seasonings? Stephen went with horseradish, butter, and smoked salt. In a few minutes, his was sizzling away as my steamed vegetables were pulled out, and the sea bass put on them with seasoned rice pulled out from the steamer. When he left, our food had been perfectly prepared, and I really needed to get Joe cooking guides for this. Maybe I could do this without screwing up. Maybe. After moaning over the perfectly cooked food, I went back to my explanation. When I was all done, they just looked at me. After a long moment, they glanced at each other and snickered. It sounded so funny to hear it from them, but it didn't surprise me. Stephen looked at me and laughed. Corey, I have done 20 years now in government service, and I don't believe I have ever been involved in as much drama and incompetence as you managed to stumble into. Yes, people used favors and threats to get different mages under them sometimes, but I have no idea what Pearl did to get you, and it blew up so badly in her face. I think that everyone realizing familiars are people too is a good thing. But Merlin... (laughs) He shook his head, still laughing a little. And really, Corey... Indira chimed in. Did you think Joe and Sable would stay home any more than we would? Trust me, we are going to be there prepared for war in every meaning of the word. She got a distant look in her eyes. I would suggest two things. Oh? I wanted to rail about them coming, but I knew I didn't have a chance of talking them out of it, so why waste the energy? See if you can get the specs on the virus so we can know what it looks like. If the Chinese are planning on using it at the party, we might be able to stop it if we know what it looks like. I felt my eyes widen as I looked at her. You don't really think they would, do you? I didn't know what to think about that, but the idea made me shudder. Breaking molecular bonds like Joe had done with the nicotine was magnitudes easier compared to hunting out a virus. You had to mutate the virus or break it apart, and you needed to know the shape of it intimately because viruses were tiny life forms, too complex for any specific identification like a nicotine molecule. Indira shrugged. Today she had on a royal blue silk blouse that made her look like she would be on a runway and managed to put on nice slacks instead of jeans. The shrug caused the material to ripple, and I spared a moment of envy to just ever be that elegant. I don't know, but it seems a simple thing to prepare for. But really, Corey... She paused, uncharacteristically hesitant as she pushed food around her plate. What? Do you really think they will be that crazy to attack? I shrugged helplessly. I don't know, but I've decided governments aren't sane. I still don't know what Japan wanted from James's research, and neither do they. Who kills someone over something when you don't even know if it exists? Stephen laughed. 
<laughs> Governments have been doing that since the beginning of time. I don't see it changing anytime soon. I sighed. My life had been easier before I knew all of this. And the other thing? Indira gave me a wintry smile. Make sure you can run in the outfit you wear to the celebration. We all fell silent. Dinner ended in a quiet camaraderie, and they promised to be at the party. Carolyn didn't get any sea bass. It was too good. Chapter 43 Section 2.45.5 All interactions between mages, if not related to draft duties, shall be regarded as private conversations, and prying by the OMO, or the draft, is frowned upon. Engendering resentment outside of the draft is guaranteed to send mages to other countries. Thanksgiving had been wonderful, if stressful, but in the end, the laughter and love made it one of the best Thanksgivings, and the largest, I'd ever had. Christmas had been much more low-key, with John Lancet, Sable's dad, staying with us and going to the Guzman's for Christmas dinner the mundane way, driving. But since then, it had been a non-stop whirlwind. While this department wasn't actually in charge of managing the party itself, we were the key points as to figuring out what the Chinese and Japanese wanted, exactly how the treaty was being celebrated, and hundred other details that made no sense to me. It was a mix of New Year's Eve and an early lunar celebration plus the treaty. It would be a huge party for everyone, and there was almost nothing competing with it. I was kept busy with crap that while I'm sure was important to someone, to me it came across as stupid stuff. I'd turned in the list well before Halloween, after removing all the mages that Tursane had unmagicked. There were only four on the list. Apparently, most of the mages she had affected were not Merlins or Archmages. The report I'd pulled from the OMO made me blink. Over three million mages had been set in an under-review status. The American Indian Nation and North Korea didn't participate with the OMO oversight, and a country or two in Africa. But to know that many people around the globe had their magic pulled away was stunning. And there were probably some that hadn't reported their magic that had been removed, especially if they were hedge mages. It was simply more information for me and data that didn't point to anything. Japan was still a mystery, though I knew Hisahito was staying at the embassy until the party, but I didn't have an answer for him. The last week was a rush of people freaking out and me trying not to roll my eyes. Even Joe and Sable seemed caught up in the drama. I'd gotten a dress that looked elegant in a rich russet red shading to gold. It was a simple sheath, but it had slits and let me move, and since it went to the floor, I could wear flats and be somewhat comfortable. Carolyn had consented to wear a black vest with a bow tie the color of my dress. He was ostensibly my date, Charles was coming as the plus one for Joe, but escorting both of them. While they had no issues showing up anywhere as a married couple, it was nice to have someone to dance with, and oddly, Charles enjoyed dancing and was good at it. I just hoped he'd realize they'd drag him to every event just to have another dance partner. I planned on staying alert. Every nerve I had vibrated with hyper-awareness, and I didn't know what else I could do. I saw the guards everywhere though they did blend in better than I expected. They were still obviously present. The party was being held in the Ronald Reagan Hall. It had been dedicated to him after he was assassinated. The fifth president killed in office. The event space was huge, with the atrium being where the main gathering was, but they had also grabbed the atrium hall and the ballrooms to lay out the food and provide areas to sit and talk. It was beautiful, complicated, and I was very glad I had done nothing but the guest list. Watching guests come down the oculus into the atrium was as impressive as it sounded, and I could have spent the entire night doing nothing but people watching. The clothes, the attitudes, the mages were fascinating. So many Merlins, but no one else had the number of filled in branches as I did. It made me feel like an outsider as eyes drifted up to my temple and did a double take. If hiding my tattoos hadn't been a crime, 
I would have applied makeup over them completely. Pearl had promised to talk to me next week about my new assignment. Just the fact that I had one gave me a feeling of hope. I was so ready to not be here. If I was lucky, I wouldn't be in Washington, D.C. at all. Joe and Sable were checking out the food, and Carolee followed them over to the tables. There was a table full of food for the familiars. I'd seen at least five others, but that didn't mean he was going to pass up what might be on the human side. Besides, he said he wanted to smell the food, make sure it was okay. But there was so much perfume and other odors, he was sneezing a lot. Everywhere I looked, people were smiling. I'd seen Pearl moving through the crowd, talking to people and being a social butterfly. For a rotund woman, she moved with deceptive lightness, and I had never seen her glow like this. Scott Yang was here and almost sported a smile on his face, but not enough that he looked creepy. And I was tight as a wire, waiting for it to all go wrong. Maybe I'm just paranoid and need to let it go. Shay had declined Joe's offer. She said he had a prior commitment this month, and part of me had been relieved. I'd rarely seen him since I started college, but he still had a way of unnerving me. I turned at the sound of a throat being cleared. Standing behind me was Hisahito and a woman. He looked calm and unruffled. She looked a bit more nervous. The tattoo on her face told me she would be one of the handmaidens. The crease between her brow told me more. I nodded to them both, offering a slight smile. Mayutsushi, I did not expect to see you here, I said when he did not introduce his companion. From what I could see, she acted like he was talking to a wall or something. I had come to see if you had made any progress in your research. He sounded hopeful, and I almost felt bad as I shook my head. I still have found nothing that James would have left for you. Mostly it is boxes upon boxes of notes. His hands tightened into fists. If the world would just leave us alone, this need would not be so great. A decade of isolation. Is that so much to ask? He said that part in Japanese, but Carolian, even though he was on the other side of the room, translated it for me. I blinked, tilting my head. Mr. Yamato, did you mean you were looking for a way to cut Japan off from the rest of the world? He froze mid-turn and glanced back at me. Looking? That is a wish. It is more what we need. Time and isolation. James said he had the answer. Now? I shall never find it out. The water wall flashed into my mind. I think I know what you're looking for. But the price will be high for your mages, and I do not know if it can make you fully impervious. It should make it much more difficult for the rest of the world to reach you. His eyes lit up, then became wary. And what do you ask for this? I wanted to say I would just give it to him, but I paused. I would like to think on it and discuss it with you, and whomever else after this event is over. He nodded, his eyes shuddered. That seems wise. I look forward to meeting with you at that time. He spun and took the woman by the elbow, and they strode off as if someone on the other side was calling to them. I watched for a long time, unable to imagine the fear and need they had to cut themselves off from the rest of the world. It would eat up most of the offerings of an archmage in a month or two, depending on their power. If they had familiars or merlins, they could support it for longer, but it would lock most of their mages into supporting that wall. Nice party. Can't say I want to do these all the time, but it isn't bad. Food is good. Charles' voice by my shoulder had me jerking a bit, and the glass of water I held in my hand sloshed on my shoe. Don't do that, I hissed, trying to get my heart rate under control. With the music and chatter of people, I hadn't heard him approach, he grabbed a glass of champagne from a waiter who was walking by, offering them to everyone, and handed it to me. Talk to you? Offer you champagne? He asked, giving me a look. Deep breath and relax. None of this is your responsibility, so just enjoy it. And if something goes wrong? I muttered, wishing my hair was down so I could hide behind it. I fiddled with the glass, but champagne didn't even sound good. Mostly, I just wanted to be out of these clothes. 
You let all the very competent people handle it. You know the people that are paid to deal with things like this. The event seemed so bright and bubbly, and I felt like I was being an idiot, jumping at shadows. Would you like to dance? I blinked and looked up at Charles, who smiled. I was dragged here so the three of you would have dance partners, and I don't mind dancing. I'd like to point out those two did the dragging, and I'm not the best dancer, I commented, looking out at the dancers. But, yes? I set the glass of bubbly down on a small table, glad to have a reason to move. Maybe I would burn off some of my nervous energy. He gave me one of his rare smiles and took my hand. The dancing area wasn't huge, and it definitely wasn't rock. But a nice box step that he led me through, not even wincing when I stepped on his feet occasionally. It was more fun than I expected. We went through two sets, nothing fancy. I knew Joe had claimed him if the musician played a waltz. I had no idea how she even knew how to waltz. Carolyn had found a corner where he and another familiar were talking. I didn't know what the denizen was, other than maybe canine, which struck me as odd. Carolyn had little patience for dogs in general. You okay? I asked as Charles led me off the floor. Erichina had declined to come saying instead she had some art to work on and a quiet evening would be nice. Why would I not be? Excellent food, the appropriate amount of fear and awe at my presence, and my queen's looking glorious. I didn't know if I should blush or roll my eyes. It just looked like you were talking to a dog. He hissed in my mind and I rocked my head a bit with the pain. Do not call an Arles a dog. That is an insult to them. They are intelligent creatures that only roughly share the shape of your poor creatures. They were both staring at me, and I swore the being he spoke to looked like a laughing dog, about half Carolyn's size. Okay, I'm sorry. Have fun. I bowed out of the conversation to his mental humph and tried not to giggle. Everything okay? Charles asked as we drifted back to the wall, out of the way of all the other attendees. If it hadn't been made very clear I needed to stay, I'd have already gone home. My own panic levels were slowly fading, all this stress over nothing. Or never come. Yeah, I'm just insulting beans right and left. I would have preferred to stay home. I mentally castigated myself for the whine. I had nothing to whine about. I get it. You'd prefer the jeans and low-key existence all the time. He sounded understanding, and I glanced up at him. You like this? He shrugged. If I needed to find a date to bring here, I would have loathed it. Being invited by three gorgeous women who like me as a person, that makes it much more fun. Besides, dancing is a good way to get some exercise. I gave him a sharp look. Over the years, he had lost weight and slimmed down. Is that what you've been doing? Taking dance lessons? Charles laughed. A true laugh. <laughs> no, my grandmother taught dance way back when, and when I was a preteen to teen, I would be her escort after my grandfather died. It started out as feeling sorry for her, I guess, but the women at her get-togethers loved to dance. They were happy when I came to dance with them. He shrugged, a hint of red on his cheeks. I think this is the first time I've danced since she died. It's been nice. I slipped my arm into his and squeezed it. You're a good man, Charles. The flush faded at that. Not as much as you might think. All of us have dark things we hide, Corey. Never forget that. Surprised by the sudden darkness in his voice, I looked up at him. He forced a smile and shook his head. You keep on believing the best in people, Corey. It's what makes you special. I slid my eyes sideways, huffing a laugh. Ha, I believe everyone is trying to kill me. I'd be happier if I wasn't so accurate. Corey. Carolyn shut a question into my brain, and I turned to look at him. He had risen to his feet, and his fur along his body and tail was rising up to a full bristle. The creature next to him was weaving through the crowd of people toward his mage, I assumed. What? I said looking around. People were still mingling, 
a few dancing, mostly in little groups waiting for the ceremony scheduled in 30 minutes. Maybe after that I could leave. Something is wrong. Tia Tang is coming. What? This time my voice was much louder, and a few people looked at me curious. I spun, trying to figure out what might be going on. In front of us, a rip formed with the accompanying slash of pain. My heart raced as I backed up. Most rips you could only see if you were looking at the right place, and then they looked like a ripple in the air. But this one gaped wide open, about ten feet from me, starting at about a foot above the floor to halfway to the ceiling. The lights and shadows in it hinted as to the realm inside. I had to remember not to lean in and try to see what was in there. People backed up from it, as it gave off a feeling of static electricity that was uncomfortable. When Carolyn brought people from one place to another, he always went through glades or locations that he knew were safe, like Banyarls or Hamadia's spaces. This was a path through the unformed regions. Only denizens could move through that safely. Humans didn't do well in raw magic. People were scattering back, and the mood changed from festive and excited to something darker and worried. I saw people filtering into groups, but I didn't have time to analyze what sort of grouping was being created as Tia Tang came charging out of the rip. Tia Tang shouted in my mind, Kuri, they have attacked you. I flinched, resisting the urge to cover my ears. It never did any good. Multiple people around us, all with color on their temples, were staring at us, and I wondered if they had heard what he said. Tia Tang, what are you talking about? I squeezed out the words, my body vibrating. They have poisoned everyone. Chapter 44 Section 2.20.6 Infractions are treated the same as the general populace with an eye toward using a mage in a way beneficial to the current jurisdiction, but a pattern of behavior will be treated much more harshly for mages. The room came to a screeching halt, even the music skittered to a stop, and everyone stared at the dragon. Tia Tang, for his part, was undulating back and forth, making me dizzy. What do you mean, poisoned everyone? I asked, trying to stay calm. I was pretty sure I hadn't been poisoned, as I'd been too nervous to eat or drink anything. I've been listening. They said they needed to occupy you, and the poison would feel that. He all but wriggled in place, and I shook my head. Titting, do you know the poison? Everything hinged on that. I couldn't do anything if I didn't know what it was. He curled up tight. They mentioned a fish, and that Japan would be the obvious source. He murmured. At this point, people had started to creep closer, their eyes flicking between me and the dragon. Carolyn's warmth pressed to my side, and I let my hand stroke his back, not caring about fur on my dress. I'd taken Indira's warning to heart and pulled out my phone. That and lipstick were the only things I had in my purse— I downloaded an app on it that was a detailed compendium of poisons, bacteria, and viruses. It was a searchable database, and it had cost a decent chunk of money. Since I had just used it for work, I would be filing it under an expense report. The government could repay me. Joe, Sable, better get over here. I knew they'd heard me, but the odds were they started this way as soon as Tia Tang appeared— I typed in fish and Japan and poison and waited, staring at the screen and ignoring the others around me. We're here. Jo wrapped her arms around my waist in a brief hug, and I closed my eyes, feeling immeasurably better. Three things popped up, and one grabbed my attention. Tia Tang, was it Fugu? I asked the name of the poison, and he stiffened, raising his head. Yes, that... He whipped his head around and went from a frantic puppy to a deadly creature in the blink of an eye. I don't know how to explain it, but where there had been frantic energy and movement waving whiskers and rippling scales, now there was stillness, sleek power, and anger. They dare. They attack my mate. They seek to hurt all and succeed in a coup. 
That shall not happen. Before I could react, he had streaked through the rip like a spear of red, and it sealed behind him with a crack. That's different. I shook my head and looked back at the poison, and everything suddenly got worse. Merlin, I hissed, and people started to step closer to me. Corey, what is it? I looked up to see Stephen striding through the crowd, and Dira following behind him. They both looked elegant, but what caught me was the worry on their faces. Tetrodotoxin, I said. Most people looked at me blankly, so I expanded. Puffer fish poison. The ripple of curses that went through the area had me freaking out as I read faster. It looked bad as I read through the symptoms. Any idea how they got it to us? Someone asked, and I shook my head. I didn't have a clue, but I didn't know how to deal with a poison. It says the symptoms are tingling, numbness of the lips, and then difficulty breathing. I looked up and blinked at the crowd of mages surrounding me. Um, that describe anyone? I could see gazes turn inward, and then people started raising hands. Crying or panicking wouldn't help. Okay, how many transform or entropy mages do we have? People raised their hands, and Indira waved them over. You should be able to find this molecule structure and break the bonds. I looked around for something to write with and sighed. I moved over to one wall and with my lipstick wrote out the formula. I was charging them for this as well. I liked this lipstick. C11, H17, N3, O8. Find it and break it, I said. Who are you to be telling us what to do? A woman said, striding out of the crowd. If you can think of something better, for Merlin's sake, do it. But I figure neutralizing the poison is the best first response. I growled out, more than happy for anyone else to do this. Charles stepped up behind me, looming a bit. She is one of the saviors of the sec. You know, she and her family here shattered the nicotine structure for an entire stadium? The woman looked like she was about to say something else. Anger flashed in her eyes though she jerked her head down in a short nod that might have indicated respect. The man next to her started to gasp. Babe, I think I have a problem. His lips had an odd tinge of blue on them, and his knees buckled as he started to go down. She lost her arrogance and caught him, lowering him down. Robert, you don't get to die on me, not like this. Around us, people were starting to gasp and choke, Others stared at their fingers with worry. Security was sprinting to me. Ma'am. Call 911. Mass casualty event. Tetrodotoxin. They'll need respirators. They looked at me, eyes grim. One of them made the call on the radio while the other kept scanning. For what? I wasn't sure. I looked around, wondering what food or drink had poisoned people, and then if it mattered. No one else was going to eat or drink anything. Mostly, I was confused and tried to stay out of the way. A few people, okay, a few dozen, were seriously ill and had collapsed, but the poison had only really started to kick in and the transform mages were knocking it out fast. There were at least two medical doctors here and everyone was spending offerings recklessly to help repair the damage it had caused. Why had they done this? Surely they had to know my history. That meant they knew I had experience dealing with poisons, and this place was crawling with educated mages. It made no sense. I spun, looking at the scattered people. Most were focused on the downed attendees, mages, politicians, famous people. The undercurrent of others sobbing and yelling for attention as first responders streamed in made it organized chaos. Frustrated and ready to run away, I backed into a corner trying to stay out of the way. I was strong, but this was better done with finesse. Movement caught my eye a split second before I heard the crack of multiple rifles. From the upper oculus and the 14th Street entrance, about 20 people in dark jumpsuits appeared, and they were shooting at us. We're easy targets. Frantic, I pulled dust and food and formed it into a shield, but there was so much area that I couldn't cover it all. Shooters! Shield! I screamed. Someday, I'd have to figure out who to thank for the draft, because at least half the mages there reacted. Not by screaming or yelling, but by grabbing tables and putting them over the wounded. 
Others sent lightning towards the shooters. Still, others set air whirling like a tornado around us. No time, Bubbles! Stephen boomed as he frowned and a gun fell apart in a shooter's hand. Grab your target, take them down. I'll get clearance. I'm FBI. It was like his words had removed a safety. And if I hadn't been so frantic to find Joe and Sable and make sure they were okay, I would have watched with awe. I know if there had been a filmmaker there, he would have filmed all of it and been muttering about winning an Oscar. I saw many fireballs, ice shards, wind, and things that had never occurred to me. A woman peeked around a table, eyes narrowed, and glared at three of the shooters on the walkway around us, and they began to scream. I could see the water pouring out of their bodies as they seemed to crumple in on themselves. Amateurs, she muttered, then dove behind the table as a hail of bullets hit. Others were just as lethal, and I wanted to be sick as I saw eyes rupture, bodies age, and at least two men drop like they'd been knocked out, which they probably had. I thought about doing a KO wave, but there were so many people that I couldn't do it as a wide band. People might die if I knocked out their caregivers. There was more than one person using air to keep people breathing as their lungs locked up from the paralysis of the drug. I flinched as a bullet impacted by my head, and I started to move. I was acting like an idiot. I spotted Joe scrambling from one person to another, Carolyn by her side as she focused, and I assumed shattered the molecular bonds to stop the poison. Sweep your air along the top and then remove it from the lungs there, Stephen barked. I kept my head down and kept moving towards Sable, who leaned over a man. Don't worry, I have the air going in and out, and I'm forcing your lungs to contract. I'll keep you breathing until help arrives. She talked to the man, who had started to get color back in his face, and he closed his eyes. You got this? I asked Sable. Not that I could do anything without my kid. I was starting to think I should just wheel it everywhere with me. Yes, but I can only do one person at a time. It requires too much concentration to risk doing multiples. She didn't look at me, still watching him. I can't move air in too hard, or I'll rupture his lungs. Too soft and he won't get his lungs to pull in the oxygen. That made sense. I knew how respirators worked, and she was simply using magic to act as one, which meant she didn't need me to hover. I looked around for anyone who needed my help, and spotted Pearl huddling near an overturned table, lips turning blue, and blood streaming down her arm. I scurried over to her side, inspecting her. Can you still breathe? Barely. She gasped, and I cussed. I looked at the wound. A bullet had passed through the fleshy part of her arm, painful and bloody, but not life-threatening. Lay down. I'm going to get your arm taken care of and see if I can help you breathe. In theory, oxygen would be better than air with all its other gases, but trying to separate out the O2 only right now wasn't something I could do and keep my eyes on the rest of the stuff. I tore a long strip off a tablecloth, using entropy to get it going as I worked on moving the air into her lungs, nice and steady. Color started coming back into her face as I tied the pressure bandage on, and I looked around. The gunfire had stopped, and from what I could see, all the attackers were down, either dead or restrained. Alexin and a few others had taken charge, and more paramedics and firefighters were streaming in with equipment and meds to help those that had been attacked. Thank you, Koi. I'm sorry we didn't listen. Pearl gasped out, in between an EMT bagging her. My life. Go. Get better. I stood and looked around. To my relief, Joe and Sable were headed toward me, a tired Carolee in between them. All three of them looked disheveled, exhausted, and their hair a bit ragged from offerings, but none looked damaged. I turned and saw Indira head in my way while Stephen was directing the people streaming in to different places. I didn't know how many of our attackers were still alive, and I didn't ask. Are you okay? I asked Indira. She'd fought like everyone else, and more than one mage had stared at her stunned. When I had time, I needed to figure out how to wield my magic the way she did. I'm fine. She looked down at her dress and sighed. So much for my dress, though. It had a melted spot or two, 
some singeing, dirt, and what looked like blood on it. None of us looked much better. Malin Manwo, came a voice from behind me, and I turned to see Chun Wen walking up, dressed in a tuxedo. He looked more elegant than in his normal suit. Chun Wen? I said nodding, and started to turn back around. It is too bad you came through this unpleasantness so well. Hui Ling won't let you mess up her plans. Fortunately, that is easily remedied. Huh? I twisted to look at him, wondering if the English hadn't translated correctly. He smiled at me as he slammed a knife into my stomach. Chapter 45 Section 2 Point twenty, point two. If a mage is convicted for a Class D or E felony, the jurisdiction may weigh the risks and the violence of the crime and choose to raise felony level. The world stopped for that instant as he looked me in the eyes, the knife in my stomach. Then he pulled it out and went to slam it in again. Corey! Carolyn screamed in my mind. There was a blur of red, and Chun screamed, a brutal, pain-filled sound that cut off with finality. I had to blink to see Carolyn standing over the limp body of Chun, whose throat was gone, his blood staining Carolyn's muzzle. Cory, multiple voices said, and I pressed my hands against the spreading red on my dress. Shit, I muttered. This is not good. Over here, no. I heard someone screaming as I stared at my stomach. The red spread across my dress, and I stared at it dumbly. Shouldn't this be hurting? Corey! I looked at Carolyn standing over me, his panicked voice ringing in my ears. Hey, it's okay. I'll be fine. I tried to smile at him, but the world tilted, and Joe's face appeared in front of me. We are laying you down, she said, her face pale and eyes wide. I nodded as I turned over the problem in my mind. Why had Chun stabbed me? It made no sense. In the scheme of things, I was a no one. Hui Ling wanted to prevent me from stopping something. What? I was in America. If she was running a coup in China, what could she think I could or would do? Let me look, a new voice said and I blinked again to see faces I knew hovering around me and a growling Carolyn draped over my legs. No wonder I felt trapped. The person speaking I didn't recognize, but he had a uniform on. I noted all that, but went back to trying to figure out the puzzle in my head. We need to get her to the hospital. The knife definitely perforated her bowel. I can smell it. Carolyn? I felt slightly outside myself, Everything focused on the enigma in my mind. Yes, Corey, he replied instantly, and I could hear both fear and rage like I never felt. Can you see if Tia Tang is okay? There was pain starting to radiate out from my pelvic area, and part of my mind checked what they were doing to take care of me. There were other yelling people moving around. I kept my attention on Carolyn, though I did want to wipe his face. He had streaks of blood all over his beautiful fur. They were moving me to a gurney, and more people were streaming in, but I knew something was wrong. What plans? How could I be involved in anything? As my attention was riveted on Carolyn, I saw his reaction. His eyes, already dilated, went full black, not a hint of the green remaining. I lifted my hand, and those around me froze. What? His eyes locked on mine, eyes dark. My queen, she has ordered two of her most trusted mages to teleport here with nuclear weapons. She called them suitcase nukes. He spoke only to me, and I didn't know if anyone else could hear him. My heart stopped, and I stared at him. She what? Is she trying to replicate the... I trailed off and closed my eyes as it all hit me. The ultimate coup. She destroys our country and everyone will think the Japanese are responsible. How could I stop it? When? I demanded, 
my mind racing. He closed his eyes, and I brushed away people talking at me. I needed to think. It was so important. After my public fights with Japan, the slap in the face of me being at the treaty, everything, them bringing nukes here would be obvious. Logical, even. Minutes. Tia Teng says he's trying to protect his chosen. The mages are attacking her under Hui Ling's command. Another pause. Hui Ling has mages with her, and Tia Teng and those royal Toshishi are fighting. It is a glorious fight, but she is talking about making sure Japan and the U.S. will never interfere again. Is there a way to direct a sidestep? I never asked because it had never mattered. He tilted his head, then nodded. They will do brute force. You can redirect, especially if they don't know their destination perfectly. Chun's assistant. Everything fit. He could teleport. The brute force that would let him get here with a warhead that would take out all of Washington, and only people that could step could get out. I could never get anyone out in time. But... I gritted my teeth. Help me up. My eyes locked on Joe's. Kuri, no. You need to get to the hospital. Joe protested, her face tear-streaked. It doesn't matter. Help me up. Lady, if they don't operate on you in the next hour, you're dead. The EMT argued, and I smiled at him. And if I can't stop the nukes, DC will be gone in the next five minutes. Take me up. Give me a shot. And then hope I put all the pieces together correctly. The area around me had fallen silent at the word nukes, and Stephen pushed to the front. Corey, what the fuck is going on? I don't have time. Hope I'm right, or Tia Tang is very wrong. Joe, Sable, are you with me? I turned my face to them, wanting them to say no, to tell Carolyn to take them to Banyarls or Atlanta or anywhere but here. Instead, they reached down and pulled me up, Joe wrapping a bandage tight around my waist. Always. We will never leave you. What do you need? I smiled, though it felt like my heart was breaking. A miracle? Jorgas, I need you! I yelled the words out. If he didn't hear me, we were all dead. Around me, people stared at me, faces white if they believed me, confused and angry if they didn't. A flash of flame and heat washed in front of me. Then he hovered there. I saw Hisahito out of the corner of my eye glaring at the bird, but I had no time or energy to waste. Jorgas, can you grant your assistance to someone as if you were their familiar? He tilted his head. If I chose? He sounded wary and looked around, then at me. Why are you hurt? Why are the dead around? Has Kaelin been eating humans? His eyes lingered on the dead wen and Carolyn's bloody mouth. I ignored all of that. Will you grant me your assistance to create a pocket realm? I need to dump two nuclear weapons into it. Will it hold? Will magic hold the radiation? His wings flapped faster, blue flames licking out from them, washing over people who stepped back. If I create one in chaos, one that will eat the radiation but I warn you, it will be deadly to anyone that goes there. Will it harm magic or leak out to harm others? I demanded as strength seeped out of me. His flames changed to orange and red. Not in the way that you mean. It will be a very long time, but eventually the realm will be absorbed into chaos. I got the feeling he was about to say something else, and the mages gathered around us all looked very interested. But if we didn't survive the next five minutes, then it wouldn't matter. Then do it. We need that realm now, or we will all die and this area becomes a wasteland. He flapped his wings, hard, and they seemed to grow. Whereas before, he'd reminded me vaguely of a red, orange, blue, and purple peacock. He grew and sharpened, and where there had been a beautiful, if frivolous, bird... A predator now flapped in our midst. I was aware of people swallowing and taking steps back, but I didn't pay any attention. I was torn between focusing on Giorgas and trying not to pass out. Cold and heat washed through me, 
and I felt lightheaded, but I didn't dare even take time to breathe. I could feel time slipping through my fingers, and no matter how strong I was, I couldn't pause the earth to give us more time. Coruscant Monroe, I grant you my focus. His voice boomed through my mind, and my hand sank into Caroline's fur, leaning on him. Joe, Siebel, may I pull on you? I might have begged, but I was going to need to figure out how to create a realm and pull everything into it in the next 90 seconds. I had no pride, just fear. They stepped up, each one of them taking a hand. For always an eternity, Sable whispered in my ear as she wrapped her arm around my waist. Joe matched her, both of them holding me up. Carolian sat in front of me, his back preventing my knees from buckling. Jorgas? Go, pull on me and imagine creating your own world. Normally I'd say decide what you want, but for now just imagine something huge, empty, and impervious. I had no time, so I just grabbed the image of a huge, gaping abyss, hungry for everything and anything, immense, untouchable, and beyond the predations of man. Magic poured out of me, the three of us, the five of us, and I wanted to scream at the sensation of so much magic pulling at me. Hurry, Cory, they're coming here! Carolian's voice was frantic, and I felt something about to appear near us. I wanted to demand why here, but the body of Chun Wen gave me that answer. It exists. It is enough. You must grab the path they are forging and pull it there, to the place you created. Georgas spoke urgently in my mind, and I wanted to sob. I didn't have the knowledge, the ability to do any of this. Kuri, use us. We're here, Joe whispered in my ear and my magic reached. The asterine in my ring sparked, then my magic surged up, matching with Joe and Sable. My entire being sung with power, filling all the branches as they held me in their arms. Our magic multiplied from what it was. Carolian was part of it, supporting and making us more than we had been. Then, Georgas added to it, and for a moment, I felt invisible. I squeezed tight. They squeezed back. I waited, the newly formed realm empty, and I trembled at the power beckoning me to use it. We had enough offerings we could have done anything with two familiars. We could have stopped the earth. Now, murmured Jorgaz, and I focused on the incoming weapons and the pocket realm I'd created. I'd always felt the place I was stepping to before I arrived, a second or two. Then I would appear. This time, I felt them coming. I never looked before, but now I could feel them coming. Teleporting was more like jumping than sidestepping. I needed to change where they were landing. My head spun and cold racked me, but I leaned into Joe and Sable, and I kept the space I'd created and I pulled the rug of reality to my space. I felt power, anger, hunger flowing through that tunnel. The radiation was a wave of need and desire. Fire, air, and more writhed in that wave of destruction. Magic swaddled me as I dropped the connection to the realm, locking it away for all existence. I hoped. My eyes opened, not that I'd realized I had closed them, and I looked at Georgas. Did it work? Did we do it? The fact that I was alive to ask answered a lot of it. But what if I dumped them someplace else? A place where others were hurt? I believe so. The realm is sealed, and unless you gave someone access, it cannot be reached. He beat his wings and looked around. I followed his gaze and everyone was staring at the three of us, and I saw a pink light coming from the asterine. It surrounded us, and I looked up into the faces of Joe and Sable. They glowed, both from the light and with joy. You did it, Corey. Sable squeezed my hand as she said that. We did it. 
I dropped my gaze to see Stephen and Indira staring at me. Then the world went away. Epilogue Our society has many laws for mages, some realistic, others punitive. But one thing that any arbitrator of the law should remember, mages are weapons. I urge this august body not to make the laws that protect us so onerous that those they are meant to control revolt. Our history tells us that when there is enough rage, numbers mean very little. Speech on the Senate floor in 1898. It was the beeping that pulled me out of the peaceful darkness. It wouldn't shut up. I had to fight to open my eyes as they seemed to be stuck together. But soon enough, a bland white ceiling revealed itself. The last few minutes unspooled at my mind, and I closed my eyes again. Obviously, I was alive. Last thing I remembered, Joe, Sable, and Carolyn were alive. As long as that remained true... I could handle anything else. You going to say something or just lay there waiting for a kiss from your true love? Joe asked, a note of humor in her voice. I puckered my lips, expecting a light kiss. Instead, Caroline licked them. Ew! Cat breath! What have you been eating, rotten tuna? I gagged and stuck out my tongue, needing a glass of water. Ha! That is your own breath you smell. I have sweet salmon on mine. Would you like some? That had me opening my eyes again. Am I dying? You're offering to share salmon? I turned my head to see him braced on the handrail of my bed, with Joe giggling behind him. I always knew you loved him more than me, she said between giggles. Sable walked in, and her face lit up as she saw me talking. Well, if he's sharing salmon, I'm dying. So I shall say my final goodbyes now. I would have cast my hand dramatically over my forehead, but given the IVs attached to it, I figured that wasn't a good move. I think the doctors might be annoyed at losing you after spending four hours patching you up, Sable said as the door closed behind her. Oh, okay, I need to sit up, have some water, and you need to spill. What happened? The need to know burned. But first, they got me water, raised the bed, had the doctor come in and look at me, and Carolyn moved over to the window bench, his purring loud enough I could hear it over the beeping. The doctor told me the knife had pierced my right lumbar region, but while it had cut two loops of my intestines, it hadn't hit any other organs. i need to stay overnight to make sure they flushed everything out fully, but he was certain I would have a full recovery and would need to do some physical therapy to strengthen the cut abdominal muscles. But otherwise, I should be safe to go home tomorrow. Stephen and Indira are on their way. You're going to have to wait until they show up as they have all the details. Heck, even we aren't sure what the outcome is or was. Joe sat next to Carolyn after lifting up his head and dropping it back down on her lap. Sable was in the chair in the room. You two are okay? Nothing happened to you. There had been so much blood. Then, with the bullets flying around, I wasn't positive they had not been hurt. Other than being exhausted and losing a good ten inches of hair? Joe said, holding up her hair that had taken a major hit. Sable figured out how to move the air for multiple people at once, and there was a watermelon who showed me how to use water to start flushing people's bodies. It was a variation of what I had at my job, but through their blood vessels and organs instead. It was very cool. I sighed in relief and sagged back a bit. Already, I felt like I could gladly take another nap. A knock sounded at the door before I could ready my next question. Lifting my eyes took effort, but I smiled when I saw Stephen and Indira slip in. They almost looked as exhausted as I felt. I'm really glad you look like shit, I slurred out. They looked at me then burst out laughing. (laughs) It may be a good or bad thing, but I know how you feel. Indira slid over and kissed my forehead. It sucked knowing you looked like death warmed over, 
and everyone coming in to see you looked marvelous. How are you? She scanned me up and down. Meh, I'll live. Tell me what happened. I demanded, forcing my eyelids to stay open. I had to know. You look like you've been beaten up one side and down the other. You sure you're up for this? Indira asked as she sat down in the last chair while Stephen settled against the wall behind her. I tried to sit up a little straighter, but the protests from my abdomen changed my mind. No, I need to know what happened and why. It's driving me crazy. I knew they were trying something, but poison? It seems so lame. Not to mention they knew I'd dealt with a poison situation before. I glanced over at Joe, who was busy paying attention to Carolyn. Though the fact that Joe saved everyone doesn't get near enough airtime. Joe let her hair, noticeably shorter and uneven, fall to hide her face. Ignore her. She's being coy. Sable said with a grin, and Joe jerked her face up to glare at Sable, her cheeks flushed with color. I snickered as she avoided all our gazes. Spill. Why in the world did all that happen? The poison, the stabbing, and then nukes? Are they insane? Why? I was so tired, I wanted to cry. But instead, I moved again, letting the jolt of pain help chase away some of my exhaustion. Stephen heaved a sigh. <sighs> Besides the fact that you seem to have a Murphy's cloak that is draped about you and everyone in your world? I glared at him. Yes, because I dispel the blasted thing every time I sense it. Everyone in the room snorted. <laughs> I have days where I think about Magic's Herald makes you a permanent lightning rod for the odd, because really, Corey, the stuff you get into. Joe stuck her tongue out at me, and I made a face. I didn't ask for this. I just tried to deal with it. There are still a few details that are being nailed down, said Stephen. But here's what we've figured out so far. Keep in mind, the general aspect is probably accurate even if some of the details aren't exactly. I let out my breath in an exasperated sigh and circled my finger, urging him to get to the point. He rubbed his nose, but I think he was hiding a smile. Very well, Merlin impatient. China had the virus for a few years, and they were getting ready to release it targeted to the exact enzyme combination you presented in your doctoral research, but your time display with the SEC football game had them worried. They still think you were the one that broke the molecule. We think they figured they needed a treaty so more people than just us had the virus. It would shift attention away, and if they spread it far enough, it would take majors giving their lives to break it down. As a virus will replicate, a basic poison won't. Either way, no one would be able to point fingers at them and we would be short of mages. Indira piped in here. And by China, we mean it was mostly Hui Lang working with the previous emperor, Qixing. The rest of the cabinet members say they didn't know what was planned, and they have all been truth-sensed. I nodded slowly, though I knew with careful words you could trick truth-sensing, and no one at those levels of government would ever be forced to speak, at least by outsiders. But the rest? I prompted, still not sure what I was missing. When you showed up at the treaty negotiations, they freaked, and it made it worse when Tia Tang disappeared with Carolyn. They were sure you were a plant to get them to force their hands. It was part of the reason they threw such a fit, hoping the State Department would sit on you. Which they did, I muttered, it had been a very boring three months. Yeah, well, with Chi Xing disposed and Xi Xi coming across as a very different sort of leader, Hui Lang decided to make a move. Remember, this is China. Long, multi-layered plans on the norm. I nodded at Stephen's reminder. It made sense when the familiar for the Empress of China was over 150 and still regarded as a child. Just how old was Smog? They had planned on the party for a while which was why they dragged their feet so much. Once they felt New Year would be selected, they made the treaty so good that Japan and the U.S. couldn't resist. Then, Hui Lang kicked everything off for her plan. What was her plan? 
I couldn't keep the question in, even if it was followed up by a huge yawn and a whimper. Her next round of meds is doing a bit, Joe said. Don't take too much longer. She'll have a week at home to get all the details. Stephen nodded, though he frowned as he looked at me. Tell me, I can handle it a bit longer. I demanded. Not knowing might drive me insane. They all gave me skeptical looks, even Carolyn, but I ignored them. Go on. Stephen shook his head, but started speaking. Japan's issue with the U.S. and you are relatively well known, so the best guess is Hui Lang decided to solve all her problems at the same time and throw the suspicion on Japan. That made no sense to me. Why would people think it was Japan? It clicked even as I fought through the drug cloud. The poison is a very Japanese-based one, and the bombs. It would look like payback from World War II. The fact that I would be killed in the same incident only increases the impression Japan was behind it. I shook my head. But what was the stuff with Chun? I waved at my belly. What brought this on? This is strictly a suspicion, and only because of Carolyn and Tieteng do I have any info at all. I motioned at Stephen to get on with it. I didn't want to fall asleep before I got all my answers. Stephen huffed at me, but I saw his lip twitch. Chum was devoted to Hui Lang. He wanted to make sure you wouldn't ruin any more of her plans. He had no idea she was sending nukes. The two she sent would have taken out most of D.C. and further. I frowned. Then how did they know where to side, I mean, teleport to? I thought they were coming to Chun. Stephen shrugged. No clue. But the Reagan building is really well known. Getting pictures and studying them, or even Chun sending pictures back, would have been easy enough to do. Oh. I rubbed my nose. They were going to kill all those people. I mean, I don't think the president would have been killed, would he? Stephen sighed. Yes, they were given a party at the White House. Those bombs would have removed most of Washington elite and thrown us into a power struggle that would have taken years to get out of. But her biggest advantage would have been taking out most of the OMO that were also at a local party in a large segment of our active Merlins. So our mage base would be severely impacted. A leadership would be in shambles, and Japan would be blamed for everything because there would be no survivors. Tieteng? I suggested, but my heart wasn't in it. No one would believe him, and there would be a war. She is still trying to take control of China, but from what I've been told, she she is winning people to her side right and left. If she holds on, it will be interesting to see what China is like with a female ruler. I nodded but my eyes kept closing of their own free will. Why the poison? The nukes would have killed everyone. Mostly a distraction. They knew you would be able to solve it, but since they spiked the champagne, they figured you would have a lot of people panicking and it would distract everyone as the nukes were coming in. And even if you knew, no one thought you'd be able to do what you did. He paused. What did you do? I opened my mouth. Stopped and shook my head. I really don't know how to explain it. What about Chun? Indira snorted. <laughs> as near as anyone can figure, he was devoted to the world that Hui Ling planned on creating and thought you were in the way. He also was behind the attack on your house in Albany. The money wired to the idiots was traced back to him. We don't know for sure what he planned or why, because someone... Stephen stopped to glare at Carolyn, who just purred louder. Ripped out his throat. But it looks like a crime of opportunity. Not anything else. The house had been intended to distract you, as most people get upset when the house burns down. If I hadn't been there? I'm not sure I wanted to know. And from the looks on everyone's faces, I had my answer. You were. The president wants to give you the Medal of Freedom. Stephen said, his words made me roll my eyes, even as Joe and Sable perked up. They started to talk about medals and China, all the flowers people were sending me, and how I was trending on social media, though almost no one realized what I did. There were cards and balloons all over the room. I'd have to look at them later. 
my eyes caught on a white origami crane nestled in a vase of flowers. And I just knew, somehow, it was from Hisahito. I smiled. I needed to find the water wall notes for him. There's no reason to keep them, and if his people wanted their isolation so desperately, I would not stop them. I let my eyes close, and the sound of my friends and family talking lulled me to sleep, secure in the knowledge they would be there if I needed them, just as I would always be there if they needed me.